Austin, Texas, home of Circuit of the Americas, which is America's home of Formula One. And this weekend, it plays host to the opening rounds of GT World Challenge America, powered by AWS. There's a lot that remains unchanged in the GT World Challenge category, but there is a big change indeed. There is no more pro-pro category. That means Pro-Am is now the featured class. And that begs the question, are last year's Pro-Am champions driving for Racer's Edge in the Acura NSX automatically the new top dogs? Happy to be back. You know, last year I think we exceeded our expectations at the first round, you know, getting that overall pole position and a win. Uh, and that sort of set the bar for us kind of for the season. This year, it's, it's a different story. Um, you know, as I said, the competition's stronger. I expect the same out of myself. And, and just with the support we have with, uh, with Acura, you know, they're, they're looking for strong performances. By all means, coming in with some confidence and, and, and some experience, um, but it's still not easy. Why not easy? Well, Bentley is back, albeit with a one-car program. DXDT back with two new Mercedes AMGs. And how about multiple AM champ Martin Fuen is stepping into pro Am with an overall pro winner as a teammate. And I've been with the series, I've been with Ferrari for many years, and uh, it's just a dream come true. It's just uh, being on the top category and just fighting for the overall win. It's just what everyone, every driver expects you know, to do. So we know each other for many years, and uh, we started at the same, same level. We started fighting each other, same feet, all those races. And now, being teammates, it's also amazing. I mean, he's a great driver, and I think we pair up perfectly. All told, there are six manufacturers running programs in the category, and in the AM class, one is particularly interesting, the Wright Motorsports Porsche. In that one, they are pairing Fred Portad, an experienced driver, and young gun Max Root. And Max has highly rated speed, and he's going to give us a look around this track with our Porsche track preview. Hello, this is Max Root, and I'm going to be taking you around a lap in the Porsche 911 GT3R at the Circuit of the Americas. So, we are passing the start-finish line ahead, and this is where we're going to be rolling up to fifth gear. We're looking for the one brake marker down to first gear. Really low-speed corner here, but maximizing our exit as much as we can, setting up for the high-speed turn two. Really on the, the edge of the balance here, looking for the top of the S's, um, you know, some strong right to left performance here and um, carrying a lot of speed through a, a crucial corner like seven, um, getting a bit of, big exit here and setting up for uh, a big straightaway, which is a crucial part of Coda. Um, really working with the balance here, big exit and pushing the car to the limit. Now going down to turn 11, off the one board, down to first gear again, getting a big rotation and back to big power. Here at Circuit of the Americas, this is going to be a great place during the race that we're going to be uh, drafting off people, trying to get the best run as possible, and then not trying to outbreak them into turn 12. So we're looking for the 150 board here. Hard on the brakes, down to first gear and uh, go into a, a tight technical part of the track, turn 13, uh, down to first gear, and really uh, maximizing the balance of the car through this tight section. Um, we're uh, working with the high and the low speed balance here. Um, and then heading out to the carousel, uh, which we are gonna be in third, shifting up to fourth gear. Getting the most out of the exit here and setting up for a clean 19. Um, it's a domino effect on this lap, so really being smooth through here pays off big time. And approaching the last turn, um, down to 20, and a big exit as we cross the start-finish line. Thank you, guys. That's a look at the track. Let's take a look at some highlights. James Safronis on the pole, but a huge start from Ziad Gondor in the black Ferrari in fifth. Yeah, big move there. He's up to third early, but out front is James Sofronis and uh, Shelby Blackstock on his debut on the attack early in the real-time Acura NSX. Lone entry in the silver category here. Bryce Ward down to the inside. Patrick Byrne in the Bentley doesn't quite see him. They touch. Bentley goes around. Nobody else collects him. Lucky getaway for Mr. Byrne. And then down into turn 11. David Eskew makes a nice move on the Mercedes. 
See there that Ward has to hesitate just a little bit, and Patrick Byrne gets that position back that he just lost. Now, a bit later on in the race, after the pit stops and the driver changes, Max Root in the Porsche and G the very experienced Jeff Westfall in the yellow Vital Speed Ferrari had a great battle, Cal. Yeah, Max is the AM leader at this point, but he's going for that overall position. But at the flag, it's all about Acura. And Shelby Blackstock had turned over to Trent Hinman, bringing it home. First win for Racer's Edge. And uh, again, in the silver category, absolutely remarkable performance. We have an absolutely beautiful day here unfolding at Circuit of the Americas. Hi, everybody. I'm Greg Creamer, joined by Calvin Fish. And it is time for the second round of the GT World Challenge America Championship, powered by AWS. And of course, it is also the opening rounds of World GT World Challenge, powered by AWS. You've heard from myself. You've heard from Cal. You'll hear from our third member, Ryan Marine, in just a little while. All right, cars are lined up, Cal, and obviously the way they do it in the GT category, uh, before they present for the pace lap, they line up echelon stall in the grid. We've had a number of uh, pre-race activities, including a track walk, an opportunity for fans to get down and take a look at the cars, but now the focus changes. It really does, and you can see the tires going on at the last minute and getting tightened up there. They keep these tires, which was allowed last year for the first time here in the United States, these tire blankets, these tire warmers to try and uh, give these drivers the edge that they're looking for on those opening laps and those big moves up into turn one. Some great battling unfolding yesterday. This car in particular was of interest because they just seem to have missed it just a little bit uh, in terms of setup. Um, obviously, the nice thing about these doubleheader weekends, they have the opportunity to tweak in the car and see what they can come up with, and uh, every team is going to make that effort. Yeah, we saw Patrick Byrne very much in the mix yesterday. Guy Cosmo did not have the day he was looking for his co-driver, but for Guy, first time he sat in that Bentley was here this weekend, so he's looking forward to getting a bit of testing under their belt and maybe having some more positive performances moving forward. And one of the big programs is the double effort from DXDT. And in one of the cars, George Kurtz uh, is in the 04 CrowdStrike AWS Mercedes. And Ryan Marine has found him. Well, George had a great run in race one yesterday. How do you repeat that success here in race two on Sunday? Well, we're going to try it again. I think it's a lot of hard work, and the car was well prepared. It was uh, easy to drive. Colin did a great job bringing it home. And I think just the consistency that we were able to bring uh, it was much improved over last year, and I think it's a big uh, result because of the, the new car. Thank you, George. Good luck. Yeah, these are the new Evos as well, Cal, and they've been tested. They've been tried already in race trim. They have with various series around the uh, the world. Obviously, Mercedes AMG have a big footprint in GT3 racing, but for that team, they only received that car about seven days ago, so still a brilliant performance to grab that podium finish here yesterday. We saw a quick shot. The two-car now, Vital Speed Ferrari program. Great news to see them step up to that double-car program. Yeah, well, Ferrari coming off a big year last year where they won the pro category with our Ferry Motorsport once again, uh, doubling up on what they did in 2018. And uh, amongst the manufacturers, Ferrari lead the way with four entries this season. And uh, we heard from uh, Martin Fuentes right at the top of the show. Interesting to see the Capex Bentley here and not have Rodrigo Baptista driving that car, but stepping into this program pretty strong. Yeah, very much so. And you'd have to think that Martin and Rodrigo running the full season together, they're going to be up on the wheel. They're going to be a dynamite pairing. And I think uh, when you look at the quiet natured Rodrigo and the uh, very energetic uh, Martin, it's going to be an interesting combination. Yeah, it should be an interesting blend as the season unfolds. About ready to get underway with the pace lap. You can see the Acura NSX safety vehicle staging down by pit out. As the field readies to head out on track, let's take a look at the starting lineup. And uh, on the pole, great effort by that Racer's Edge car again. Yeah, very much so. It's going to be uh, Trent Hinman starting the race here today, and he'll share it with Shelby Blackstock. And uh, alongside is going to be Matteo Cressoni in the TR3 Racing Ferrari. A great performance to put that Ferrari up on the front row. And you move into the next row, it'll be Rodrigo Baptista starting in that uh, Scuderia Corsa Hublot Ferrari. And then Kyle Marcelli in the second of the Racers Edge cars. And of course, the defending drivers champions. Looking further down the field, George Kurtz. Uh, it's going to be uh, Colin Brown starting the race, but they're looking for another podium run. There you see the GMG Porsche had a great run yesterday, winning the Pro-Am category and another overall podium for James Sofronis 
in his 27th year of World Challenge competition. Quite remarkable. And all the cars staging in their pit box is not necessarily in grid order, uh, but it's going to be a good one. DXDT Racing with Ryan Dial and David Eskew. Uh, very strong pairing. Uh, Windward Racing bringing the older Mercedes AMG, the beautiful silver number 33. Russell Ward, uh, the son starting. Dad will be taking over from him. That's Bryce Ward. Yeah, and I think they're looking forward to this year. They've joined forces with HTP from Europe. Globally, they're going to be doing 60-plus races this year, so a very busy campaign for both of those drivers. And you just saw that number eight, Capex Racing, Bentley Continental GT3 with Patrick Byrne and Guy Cosmo will be on board that machine. And then, of course, the vital speed machines that we've been talking about there is Ziad Gondor and his teammate, of course, uh, is going to be starting at Matteo Cressoni in the TR3 Racing Ferrari. And now let's get down to the front of the grid for that special command with Ramses Martinez, Director of Information Security at Amazon. Drivers, start your engines. All right, the engines spring to life. And again, a big thank you to AWS stepping up big time on a global level for the GT World Challenge now powered by AWS and of course GT World Challenge America long supported by AWS powered by AWS here in North America as well so as you can see the Acura NSX safety vehicle beginning to move the iconic tower has some spectators up on top looking forward to this second round of GT World Challenge America powered by AWS So the field making its way out of pit lane and then they'll be resuming and picking up their starting positions for the field. Only need one pace lap here at this track. It's uh, long enough certainly that they can get some heat. But I think a big story, we talk about heating the tires, but they're new tires. Yes, that's right. And uh, new uh, compounds and construction for Pirelli floor this year. So uh, that changes the notebook a little bit. And certainly this racetrack as well has changed a little bit. Just under three and a half miles, but it's been resurfaced. It certainly suffered a little bit with some recent winter months where um, had a lot of rain, not so much the cold temperatures here in Texas, but the rain had really washed out the foundation a little bit. So the circuit has done a tremendous job in some repaving areas, certainly through one and two. When you come out of the tight corner on that back straightaway, there's a lot of resurfacing done there. And through the final sector from the exit of turn 15 all the way to the exit of turn 19 a lot of those bumps have gone have been gone and certainly smoothed out and this is where everybody's got to give some serious chase here because uh, uh, it's a long track you got to hustle it uh, to get up and catch that Acura NSX safety vehicle as we head down this is one of those very key corners you heard Max talk about it uh, you're heading down this uh, hill out of this little sweeper down into turn 11 you got to get the car to rotate properly because you need power down here early you do and uh, the key with this race 90 minute format a mandatory uh, pit stop will happen between the 40 and 50 minute mark of this race so you can change tires so for these uh, starting drivers they've got their own set of Pirelli P0s to work with there'll be a tire change done during that pit stop window so but you still got to manage it even if you're going to run a long 50 minutes then we anticipate for a lot of the pros who are starting you want to keep that faster driver in as long as possible to maximize your strategy they have to be careful on these opening laps how they go after it, particularly out of those hard acceleration zones and if you're in the AM category as you talked about or in the new silver category you can manage it pretty much if the drivers are equal in pace yeah, and I think that's what you're going to be looking for, certainly from that lead Acura that leads the field right now. Trent Hidman coming off a GT3 championship in North America last season. Has a lot of time in one of these Acura NSX. And uh, Shelby Blackstock on his GT3 debut. What a performance he put in. Hounding James Safronis early, grabbing the lead, and stretching it out before his pit stop. Lights are out on the NSX safety car. We are getting ready to go racing here again. Round two of GT World Challenge America, powered by AWS. 
What a venue to start a season off, Circuit of the Americas. Field now starting not just to pack up a little bit, but you need to get paired up because now when you exit this uh, next couple of corners, you've got two, and then you're onto the front straight. And it's important to note, Cal, you start farther down than the finish line is, so there is an actually a start zone. Once the pole sitter gets into that zone, it's up to them when to go, right? It's up to the pole sitter to then really demand the pace, but if you get to the end of the acceleration zone, then suddenly the green flag is going to fly anyway. What can Crisoni do in that Ferrari on the outside of the front row alongside Trent Hinman for Acura? It's going to be fun to watch. Certainly Ziad Gondor, the teammate to Crisoni, was very aggressive at the start. Let's see what the very experienced Matteo Crisoni can do onto the front straight. Field is there. It's all in the hands of Trent Hinman. Once he hits that acceleration, though, there he goes, and we are green! Green flag here at Circuit of the Americas. Crisoni, but look at the move right there. Marcelli trying to follow his teammate, get way down to the inside. It's an accurate one, two by the time they get to turn one. Yes, Ferrari side by side. Three Ferraris there in close proximity as they come down through turn two. Not a great start there for Baptista. He's now under pressure from Colin Brown as Baptista is off the road. Nice move there, however, by the experienced driver Ryan Dial realizing that Baptista was going to probably just float right back in front of him. Opened it up, let him come in, no contact early. That just makes sense. You don't need to be out that early, but Acura running 1-2, Racer's Edge. Boy, these guys are on it here this weekend. They uh, made the move to GT competition last year with a media effect winning that Pro-Am Championship. Got the overall win here yesterday, and right now they have both of their cars leading this pack. A little bit of juking going on right there as Dial trying to protect by the uh, co-driver, the number 14, a guy named Jerome Bleekemolen, who's got some chops and is a busy man, and he's focusing on Porsches this year. He really he? is. He's running a, a variety of programs globally, all in Porsches, so he's trying to score those uh, vital Porsche points. But right now at the end of this back straightaway, he gets in the draft of Dial. Is he close enough to make this move? No, he has to tuck back in. Dial defends. Very close there as they turn into the apex of 12, almost a touch. Well, that's two experienced guys who uh, I think they're pretty confident running with each other, know what each other will do. But you don't leave the nose there that long if you're not sure. And both of them giving each other that little bit of racing room. And Dial has already been kind to one competitor when Baptista came back in front of him. I'm not sure he's going to be that generous no. throughout the rest of the and day. He's going to be frustrated with the day they had yesterday. They led the opening practice here, so things will look good for that group. But that's sort of like a come backwards for them. But Bleakham only, he gambled in what was a damn qualifying session yesterday. Went from wet tires onto the slicks, but did a little bit too late. Hence his uh, backward group position. And that's that tricky turn 19. It falls away a little bit to the apex. As you turn in, you don't see the apex. It's easy to carry just a little bit too much speed and uh, running wide there a little bit. I think in the opening laps, they'll give everybody uh, a little bit of breathing room in terms of the track limits, but they've been saying we're going to enforce it, so don't be uh, too aggressive with it. Boy, and I'll tell you, Max Root right now, he is under attack by uh, Greg Liafouge. That's the Stephen Cameron Racing number 87 BMW. Ooh, way wide for Max. Really wide there, and he's coming from the back of the pack. His teammate damaged the car in the first qualifying session yesterday, so Max didn't have the opportunity to even get behind the wheel for his qualifying run. Hence, he's starting at the back. He's got to be patient. He showed it yesterday. Young man, only 20 years old, has a great resume, has like 35 podiums from 50 races in his racing career. A lot of eyes are on that young man. Right now, they're stacked up a little bit behind Alan Metney, who's leading in the AM category in the Park Place Motorsports Porsche. He shares with David Ducote, and uh, Metney has had su success here in GT Cup racing in this series. He's had a pole and a win, and right now, everybody's trying to figure out because the guys behind him are running Pro-Am. Oh, what a touch there! As Cosmo getting to the back of Lea Fuji in a huge evasive mood by Root. Yeah, I think Guy was not trying to make the move, but he tucked the nose down in. There's kind of no man's land, and as Greg turned in, there was contact. Not like there's too much damage to these cars. They may have stalled it. They're just trying to get some life back into the Bentley and into the BMW at the same time as the rest of the field now pours through turn 12. Well, the good news is, in terms of cautions, there's a big, big gap here between that incident and where the leaders are at this stage. Obviously, if they cannot get them started and moved, they're going to have to do something about that. But right now, once again, Trent Hinman uh, in that number 93 Racer's Edge Acura NSX has opened the margin up a little bit over Kyle Mar uh, Marcelli in the number 80 team car. Here's a look at Trent. 
A lot of people were curious about that silver-silver combination, how they would stack up with the Pro-Am combination. Certainly yesterday, Blackstock did a brilliant opening stanza, handed over the car to Kyle Marcelli with a healthy lead and with no cautions in the second half of the race. He just cruised to victory. Right now, race's edge looking very strong here. This Acura NSX well-suited to Circuit of the Americas. All right, let's take another look at what happened here, Cal. Yeah, I don't think that was really a move for a pass there. Just a guy got his nose down at the inside, and as Greg turned in, there was contact. Nice job by Max Root there, the young man avoiding contact with both cars there as they stumble there through the corner. Also a nice job by the number six, able to cut down underneath. That's Rich Beck, who's starting in the second of the vital speed cars. One of them runs in Pro-Am, one is an AM, and the number six is the AM car. Lea Fouge able to continue. Uh, not a moment too soon as these Acuras are approaching quickly. Crisoni hanging on right there in third over Westfall. The two Ferraris, third and fourth right now. And Colin Brown in fifth in the Mercedes. Things settling in now. Should have good tire pressure, good tire temps. It'll be fun in the sweet spot with these probably P zeros. Bleaker Molen falling away a little bit. From Ryan Dial there in the black number 63 DXDT Mercedes AMG machine. You know, the series has raced here for a number of years, but you can see that big black pavement change here. As Baptista taking a look down to the inside of Colin Brown, makes the move stick at least at this point. That would be for the top five. Colin Brown going to try and go around the outside. Thinks better of that, tucks in. Not allows Dial to close into the tail end, but Colin Brown comes back. That's a nice move there. Baptiste is now thinking about another move into 15. Nowhere to go with it. Good hard racing through this section of the racetrack. Well, that was the experience of Colin Brown. Once uh, he got back in front, he knew exactly where Baptiste was probably going to try and make a counter move and covered it. Baptiste scored the opening round victory here last year with Maxime Soule in the Capex Bentley. Number three. Knows his way to victory lane, but it's a hard battle right now up inside that top five. It's an interesting dynamic here. You look at that Mercedes we talked about. Those are the brand new Mercedes AMG GT3 Evos uh, that have run one race already. All the Ferraris here are the previous Evo version. They're not the updated one, but through the concept of BOP, the cars should still be relatively close. So we go back and take a look at the start here, and again, a huge move by Marcelli just to force his way up in a second. Yeah, it really was nice, kind of. Uh, Crisoni had nowhere to go. He was on the flank of our pole sitter, Trent Hinman, and that just opened up the door for Carl Marcelli. The momentum. And then this little battle here between Colin Brown and Baptista through the S's. Baptista has to give it up, and then he's under attack immediately by the black Mercedes AMG of Ryan Dial. And I just realized why Baptista lost that ground at the exit of one. The back end stepped out big time, and he had to save it, and that's what cost him that momentum. And he got a bit freight train. Uh, but uh, the reason I was talking about under the BOP rules, the car should be still relatively uh, similar. And we just saw Baptista able to get down underneath Colin Brown in the braking zone. Well, kind of a cut and paste from the previous lap. So let's see if <laughs> yeah. Rodrigo can get the draft again down this long back stretch into that brake zone. Maybe Colin will protect the middle of the road a little bit more than he did the previous lap. There you see him just, uh, he's totally entitled to pick his line, but here comes Rodrigo again. Looks to the inside, faints to the inside. Dial, an interested observer right behind them. Ooh, and there was Baptista thinking about it again, and Colin, he's in serious defense mode at spots here, isn't he? He really is, and that's costing them time to the group up ahead with Westfall County in that bright yellow vital speed Ferrari running in the fourth position, third in class. And obviously, you never want to give up a position track. Uh, you know, your race position is crucial, but if you're letting everybody get away and you know you're holding them up, do you think, well, let me let this guy through, then maybe I follow him and we can track him down here as we see the BMW in the pits? Yeah, there's some damage there. That's the contact down into turn 11 between Guy Cosmo and Greg Leofouge. Great year last year for Stephen Cameron Racing, who campaigned this uh, BMW M6. They won the GT4 Sprint X competition with Greg Leofouge behind the wheel. Sheeran, that car was Sean Quinlan. They're working hard on getting the M6 a little bit more drivable this year, working with the lag system on the turbo, as long as the suspension to get the car a little bit more drivable. Fierce battling everywhere on this track in the early going here at Circuit of the Americas. Today's coverage is brought to you in partnership with 
Acura, with Bentley Motorsport, and with Ferrari. Right before we uh, roll those billboards in, you saw Bleakamol in there in that uh, blue and white Porsche doing it again. He was just lagging a little bit for a while, Cal. I think it just took him a little bit longer to get those Pirellis to come up to pressure because suddenly he's in attack mode. He is in attack mode, but as you can tell from the depth of the field, there's no easy pickings here. Even though he's down in the eighth position, he's not going to blast through this field, even though they got that Pro-Am victory yesterday. They're currently seventh in class and eighth on the road. Again, this field led by Trent Hinman in that silver-silver combination of he and Shelby Blackstock. And every once in a while, you'll see guys uh, in, in close quarters racing in the GT3 category, and you think, well, just stay tucked in that draft and then make that move. But sometimes they have to get out of that toe just a little bit because there's a fair amount of aero sensitivity on the nose of these cars, and if you don't get some air on that nose, uh, you can start to overwork those fronts. So sometimes you'll see them driving unique lines. Yeah, and certainly this racetrack allows you to do it. It's very wide. There's a lot of racing room around the circuit, but you're dead right, Greg, in terms of if you uh, sit through the high-speed corners in particular, they are so aero-dependent. You can see the little widgets and winglets on these cars to really generate that downforce and the grip and the cornering speeds we're seeing. Fast lap right now, maybe not a big surprise. Trent Hinman at a 2 minute 5.634 second lap. That's a pretty good lap here. Uh, when they did their qualifying, uh, obviously the conditions were damp at best, and uh, so well quicker than where they qualified right now. And Hinman uh, is making a, a good run of it at this stage. He is, and it's all about managing these tires. It's a long stint that they're going to be putting in right now, potentially up to 50 minutes. So, only 12 minutes into this run right now, so there's a long way to go before they're going to be making that mandatory pit stop and putting on fresh tires. So you've got to be careful with this, and certainly Kyle Marcelli, so much. Uh, success last year taking three wins and the pro-am championship he'll just be fighting his time you would feel and uh, being patient and managing those ties in the early going well, a huge amount of experience isn't there behind the wheel of this uh, really interestingly graphic tr3 ferrari mateo Cusoni. yeah he's had a, a lot of years behind the wheel of a ferrari and one there, hidden gem, <laughs> so just kind of sneak him out pop him in the competition and then immediately gets the job done putting that car up on the front row yesterday and Jeff Westfall in that uh, yellow Vital Speed car that he's sharing with the uh, young Trevor Beck, who is a young guy with a, a bright future as well. Here, there's a look at Colin Brown as he continues to run in fourth in class in Pro-Am, fifth overall. And he's actually got maybe a smidge of breathing room finally over Rodrigo Baptista. And Bleakamola continues his attack on Ryan Dial for that seventh spot. Good look there as we are watching Colin Brown continuing to try and stay in front of a persistent Rodrigo Baptista. And uh, Colin doing a very nice job at this stage. Let's take a moment and visit with the third member of our broadcast team, Ryan Marine. Hey, Greg, thank you very much. We've got Martin Barkey down here. He's watching on. Is Kyle Marcelli got a great start in the Racer's Edge NSX that you share with him. He followed Trent through, it looked like, at the start of the second. Was that the team's plan to approach turn one like that? Well, well, Ryan, anytime you start in fourth, yeah, the plan's always to get to first or second. So uh, Ryan, um, Kyle made a great move up at turn one and uh, just nice and smooth and sort of slotted in right behind uh, the sister car. So you know what? The Acura is, you know, it's, it's good right off the start. We got the tire warmers now that, that all the teams have. So a lot of times it's just who can... Uh, who can plug the car where they want it with the warm tires as early as possible, and Kyle was able to do that in the uh, in the Acura this morning. This car was so strong with this driver pairing here a year ago, and that seems to be the case once again. What is it about this track that suits you, the team, the car? Well, Ryan, I appreciate that, and we had a great run last year, of course, and we're here to, to defend the title. But I got to tell you, there's a lot of strong teams here. You know, the um, yeah, there's I can rhyme off probably four other guys that are right up there with us for sure. And, uh, you know, it's just going to be a fun year all the way through. Coda, I think generally, I think we both like it here. I think it's good for our, our car particularly. And, of course, you know, HPT, HPD gives us a good car. Racer's Edge gives us a good car. And then both Kyle and I, as with most of the drivers here, have lots of laps on uh, VI, or on, sorry, guys, on Coda as well. So uh, you just plug it all together and it gives you a good opportunity. 
It was a one-car team a year ago. You expand to two. You got the Silver Cup entry under the roof as well. What does that bring to the table? Yeah, super exciting. It brings brings about 15 guys when it comes to lunchtime. Um, you know, so lots of management for ownership, uh, just getting everybody in the right place at the right time. But I think it just brings uh, you know a professional, an added professional level for Racers Edge and even for Acura and HPD, where you know the two cars look great, they perform well, as you said. You know, they're one and two right now. Uh, I think it's just good for everybody involved. Thanks, Mark. Appreciate it, Ryan. Well, and I think there's that another element to that too, isn't it? I mean, Trent Hinman's had a fair amount of success recently in Acura NSX GT3s. That brings another perspective in terms of data and just experience. Yeah, totally. He's run with a different team and a different championship, so they probably run their car a little bit differently. They can try some of those setups. It's a different tire, of course, it's not necessarily going to work, but over the course of a weekend when you're a two-car operation, you can go off in a different direction if you're kind of struggling for grip and just try and sort out between the two cars, between the four drivers, so you should certainly have the ability to work well as teammates and make a bit more progress. Fun battle watching here, these two Ferraris, Cressoni and Westfall. Mateo, just an incredibly experienced driver. Um, you described him as the, you know, sort of the undiscovered diamond, and he sort of purposely kept under the radar, I think, as he shows up, as you said, plug him in, and suddenly he's right at the front of the field. And in Westfall, you got a guy who's equally experienced and uh, a lot of time in Ferraris as well. He does, and uh, he's running four different championships this year, so he's going to be very busy. He's very excited about the 2020 season, coming off a GT4 championship win last year in North America. So he's got a lot of momentum on his side. It's exciting to see this Vital Speed team back with two cars, potentially for the whole season. And what an incredible opportunity for his teammate, Trevor Beck, who uh, was, was very quick when he started racing in Ferrari Challenge. Trevor's a young man, and to have the experience the speed of Westfall to be able to uh, compare with data, etc. I think that's a, a great story indeed. And uh, then behind them continues to be Colin Brown hanging on right now, fourth in the Pro-Am class, fifth overall uh, with Baptista Dial in the uh, black Mercedes, Lika Molen, and then now up into the ninth spot overall in the lead in the M category, the number 20 Wright Motorsport Porsche of Max Root. But uh, we continue to watch this here and uh, just love the graphic package on that TR3 car. And that showed up. Everybody just was uh, really impressed with the look of it last year and also with its pace. Yeah, for this team, when they showed up, they burst onto the scene at St. <laughs> Petersburg with Daniel Mancinelli a couple of years ago and just immediately had pace, put their Ferrari on the pole. They've got a lot of experience running Ferraris over the years. Gregory Romanelli really runs a top-notch operation. And whenever they show, they seem to be right in the mix for the victory. Up into turn one. Gives you a little idea, that, that shot of the elevation up into one. You get up there, then you drop down here into turn two. And uh, turn one is a really tricky corner. I mean, it opens up to the apex, but as you make that huge climb, and you've talked about it before, gravity allows you, as you're climbing, to break really late. But you've got to be precise in when you come off those brakes, because if you go too long, it flattens out to the apex, and you just lock up and overshoot. And if you lift, or if you lift too soon, same story. You're going too fast. I mean, it's a tricky piece of real estate. It really is. It's wide open, and because of the elevation change and with the grip level and the downforce of these cars, you can leave the braking incredibly late. But you still got to time how you take your foot off the brake pedal and try and release the nose and get back to power. So it's very awkward indeed, particularly when you're in traffic. We now focus on our athlete, the young Max Root, 20 years old been hearing great stories about this young man doing a lot of testing with Porsche in GT3 machinery lately ran in Bahrain last year he also did a big test last weekend in fact at Sebring and uh, every time he jumps behind the wheel just gaining experience and he's got the speed and certainly has the potential to go a long way in our sport there's a look at the DXT racing DXDT racing excuse me CrowdStrike Mercedes Evo and Colin Brown is wheeling and we'll be turning over to George Kurtz and uh, Colin, I mean, everybody who's followed road racing in North America for a few years knows how exceptional a talent he is. But uh, the people that have just been sort of following GT3, it's important to note that George Kurtz uh, won a uh, GT4 Am championship on his way up in a decimatingly dominant fashion. And uh, he has been really working on his speed and race -wise. He really has. He won the championship back in 2017 on the back of nine victories. So he was almost unbeatable that year. 
and then he made the move to GT3, which was a big step for him, and then he finally found a platform last year with his Mercedes, admittedly this year, now as the Evo kit, that he's really comfortable with. Colin has been his coach for a long time, and when they moved to the Sprint X format, where you have two drivers uh, working in the same car together, he was the natural choice. He's got a lot of belief in Colin Brown in terms of the mentorship that he provides and the tutelage that he gives uh, George Kurt. So it's going to be a potent combination, but it's a very tough field. We've lost the Pro Pro combinations, but there's still a lot of tough pros in this field. Oh, no doubt one of them in the team car, that black DXDT Mercedes just coming into frame right there with the Salco. Sponsorship on it, then there's Jerome Bleekemolen. And uh, to talk about the level of pros, he's certainly one of the absolute best, but I was talking about Ryan Dial and that black Mercedes, a uh, huge, huge amount of speed and racecraft and experience. He really does, and uh, what's going to be curious to see is how these amps stack up. I mean, with the pros, they're all on top of their game. There's literally a tenth or two between the top drivers at this level, but in the amps, they come into this race, into this championship season, with various degrees of experience and various degrees of speed. So I think we're going to see a lot more ebb and flow in the second half of this race, possibly some more overtaking. And in this category, when they do those mandatory pit stops, you do change tires along with drivers and then do some refueling. So you need to preserve the tires to be able to still have some speed at the end of your shorter stint, but you don't have to keep them alive for an entire race. And uh, that allows these pros to really push a bit. Absolutely. Bring the neck of this car and uh, his own bleak ball and he recognizes that his teammate, James Sophronis, most experienced driver in this field in World Challenge competition. Could be one of the top AMs, so he just needs to keep it tight. He'd love to leapfrog around a few of these cars and have the track position, but as long as he keeps tight to this pack, that's still going to give the team the ability to uh, work some strategy in the pit stop and then James to do his stuff when he gets behind the wheel. Good look at that GMG Crowd Strike 511 Tactical Machine. Very eye-catching uh, graphic package on that car. We've talked about a few of them. There's one that we've been alluding to. The Sony Root continues to lead in the AMP category. Uh, Alan Metney in that 73 Park Place Motorsports Porsche still sits second in the class, and Rich Beck in the number six Ferrari is third. And we saw Leia Fouge into the pits and uh, had to do some work on that car. Hopefully he is uh, able to get back out. Looks like he's back out and lapping. But uh, meanwhile, we've been uh, wondering, uh, Guy Cosmo still sits back eighth in the Pro-Am category in that Capex Bentley, and Ryan Marine has found his co-driver. Right here in pit lane, and uh, Patrick, the guys were kind of wondering what's going on with Guy. We kind of were expecting to see the Bentley a little bit further up. I'm sure you guys were as well. How has this race played out? Yeah, we just, uh, the rain caught us out in the qualifying, so we started from the back, and uh, obviously there's that little instant where they came in. So um, now we're really coming from the back. We just, we had some ground to make up. There was some uh, tire regulations earlier in the week that have changed since then. And so we were playing some catch up kind of all week and we were hoping to learn a lot in the qualifying and then the rain hit, so we didn't learn anything. So this whole week's kind of been a catch up week. It will not happen again. Expect a 2020 difference. We'll be a more up at the front of the pack. But uh, yeah, now it comes down to me when we do the driver change to really run through the field. And for you guys, coming in with limited knowledge of this Bentley platform, losing that track time in the dry this week, maybe that's extra painful because any lap you get, those are laps that you need to be learning so early in this program. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the team's very capable. The team's great. They know all, all this knowledge. Really, the only thing that's changed is that tire, and it just caught us out. Um, just with that rain, there was not enough time. We did some testing, but the tire wasn't available at the time and inside those constraints. So um, just the one tire change, I mean, and after this weekend, it's a different story. We have some time to test. We have some time to learn some stuff. So that's what's going to change things. The team's capable. They know how to bounce back. They're very fast. They're very good guys. And the car is a phenomenal car. It's very capable. And that's what I was going to ask next. We've seen the car be successful. Yeah. And we've seen you be successful in other cars. I can't imagine, though, that any of that is all that similar to driving one of these Bentleys. It seems like a unique animal. Sure, and uh, we can, well, obviously we have the data from last year, so we can overlay it. We're driving this car faster than we did last year. They were on pole, they won. Um, so really what it is is the rest of the field is driving, it's so much faster now. We're over a second faster than they were last year, and the rest of the field is just two seconds off of them. So um, I don't know if 
they are going much, much faster, or we're just missing out on this tire, but it's probably a combination of the both. We're very capable in the car. Uh, it's a proven platform. The car's great. We have guys from Bentley, from M Sport that developed the car. They're giving us, giving us all the information we can have. So it really comes down to we just need to learn more that the other teams obviously have. And um, I don't know if they just fluked it or they did somehow got the tire and tested it. But uh, this is the only weekend that we're behind the curve. Don't worry. Well, it's great to have you, Guy, and K-Pax in the series full-time this year. Best of luck in your stint. Thanks. Great to be here and keep watching. Well, he's absolutely right about the KPEX program. Uh, they are pretty legendary in what was then Pirelli World Challenge and a lot of success last year as well. They'll be in the hunt, and Guy Cosmo hunting right now. Interesting comments from uh, uh, Patrick Byrne. I mean, you know, talking about when you don't have an opportunity to test on the tire and then you lose that track time, and then when you think you're going to learn something, it's wet, so you don't really learn a whole lot. That can put you back a bit. It, it really can, and for Guy Cosmo, he sat in this car for the very first time here this week, so uh, he was not available when they did that one-day test at Sonoma about a month ago. Patrick got a little bit of seat time, so it's a learning process, and uh, I know that that group, all of the ingredients expect success. The team Bentley does, the drivers do. They've had success together before in very competitive categories, but it just really showcases that you have to show up and be ticking every single box if you're going to be at the front of this field. Well, and as you said, these teams run at such a high level. I mean, the minutest changes can affect the performance of these cars, and uh, when you get something thrown at you that uh, is, is new like a new tire, just matching the two, the card of the tire, uh, that is uh, is a bit of that black art of uh, car setup, and uh, they'll get their heads wrapped around it, that's for sure. And uh, this is way early. Yeah, this is uh, not going to be part of the mandatory pit stop. This is an unscheduled stop here for Max Root. Yeah, he'd gone to the lead in AM and was comfortably in the lead, but some sort of a problem going right into the cockpit area. Hadn't heard anything up to this point, and he was turning some pretty darn quick laps. Doing a couple of 227, 207 flats. Almost makes you wonder if something didn't come loose inside the top belt. So, something maybe else. Yeah, so, so. get a report on that as we look at Alan Metney. He's uh, hoping to do a few more appearances this year. It's not a full time effort from Park Place Motorsports, certainly legendary Porsche entrant. Had a lot of success over the years in various championships globally. Alan is a last minute decision and uh, he certainly got his eye on some of the uh, new formula that we have coming this year, the Sports Club America, which will debut a little bit later this season. That's an exciting new addition to this championship to be sure. It's Brian Dial now after Settling for just a little bit is starting to pick the pace up, and he has closed within a few car lengths of the number one Hublot Ferrari of Rodrigo Baptista. So that uh, Yusalco EXDT Mercedes on the prowl once again. And a uh, little bit of a gap, a little bit of breathing room back to the number 14 of Bleakamolen at this stage as we put another lap in the books here. Flash across the start-finish line and start to climb up into turn one. There is the number one on Rodrigo Baptista's car. And uh, the reason the... Well, we're getting a report here, the car, that car, uh, getting a report a little bit, uh, little bit too much at the exit of turn 19 here in terms of running wide over there. And the uh, stewards have said, we'll give you a couple of warnings, but at some point we have rules for a reason and we have to enforce them. So uh, we're gonna have to look at that. Meanwhile, uh, Brian, what are you hearing about the Wright Motorsports Porsche? You guys were speculating it might be something to do with the seat belts and you were spot on. That's exactly it. Seat belt came loose for safety reasons, of course. They had to jump in and get that rectified and sit Max Root back out. All right, thanks very much. Uh, that's a sketchy little deal here. If something comes loose in those seat belts and you eat as, as tight as these seats are, you still start floating around a bit too much in there. Uh, it's not comfortable to start with, and too, it's spooky. 
Yeah, and sometimes it can happen if you have a big moment and suddenly your arms and elbows inside the cockpit as your arms and your hands come across your belt. It can suddenly hit that um, six-point harness there and loosen it up. So I'm not sure what happened or whether it was just a fault with the buckle itself. But either way, that cost you a lot of time coming down pit lane, which is a bit of a shame. We're going to fight hard to try and get that second victory here this weekend now. Well, I'll tell you, I'm not sure that it's necessarily Colin Brown has found a lot of speed in his run down Westfall. Looks like Westfall may have just dropped off a little bit from the 24 of Personi. Is now Brown is much closer, and that 24 Ferrari has uh, opened that margin up a bit, Cal. Yeah, last lap, they were all pretty equal right in that uh, pack that they're running in. There's that turn 19 that uh, Baptista got the call on. Essentially, that white line that his right sides were on right there, you've got to have some part of the car essentially touching that as you come off the corner. He's a little bit wide there, so again. <laughs> He repeats it. We saw some uh, calls yesterday with the various classes about repeated offenders will get the drive-through penalty, and that will hurt you really badly with an unscheduled start pace. So you've got to be on the money. This racetrack is a steward's nightmare just policing that because you can't have your eyes everywhere, and people can be taken advantage of it where you're not seeing them, but they're certainly doing the best job they can here this weekend. They got lots of cameras, they got all this stuff, but they don't have 20 stewards up there wanting to look at each camera. And uh, when they're focusing on something else, it sort of changes the dynamic a little bit. And, uh, and Westfall right now seems to have uh, been able to take a couple of car lengths back away from the pursuing Colin Brown. We saw the, uh, the Ferrari, we were talking about the Hublot car, the number one, and you might be wondering, well, Pro-Am is the top class now. Why is the number 80 running? And as they were the uh, champions, they wanted to keep their number 80, and they are certainly uh, allowed to do that. And if you feel like it's a lucky number or whatever, and uh, so they uh, said, well, the AM champion was Martin Fuentes in that car, and they gave him that number. So nice to be carrying a number one. Certainly is, and look at some of the fast laps that are being run right now. I'm not sure if Marcelli caught some traffic on the last lap, but Hinman ran a 206.5. Marcelli's was a 208 flat, so that has really extended that gap up front between the two Acuras, now up over five seconds. Looking at this fierce battle that continues between Baptista, Dial, Blake, and Nolan still hanging in there. Well, certainly there are places on this track, and it's nice and wide, and you are, are able to uh, just get around traffic easily, but if you catch traffic as you turn into turn three in those S's, you can be trapped behind it pretty much all the way to 10, can't you? You really can, and you can't hit the disappear button, and uh, you got to keep it on the uh, straight and narrow, so to speak, so it's very difficult and it's very frustrating for the driver who's being balked a little bit, but equally um, for the driver who's trying to get out of the way, you just uh, can't hit the vanish button, so. Just got to hope that the ebb and flow, that it goes both ways during the course of the race, but certainly Marcelli lost a chunk of time to the leader during that lap. And the uh, other side of that coin, in that same lap, that he had run a 208, Grissoni had run a, a uh, low 206, and that margin now from Marcelli to Grissoni, which is for the lead in Pro-Am, has dropped to just a tick over a second. And uh, we're going to have to keep an eye on uh, that because the last lap, Grissoni ran a 206.8, and again, Marcelli at 207 even. So Personi closing in. He is, and it's uh, certainly going to be on Marcelli's mind that he's going to try and uh, stretch that gap back out before they do the pit stop. They lost a bit of time in the pit lane yesterday. Barkey got a penalty of two seconds, so they had to hold the car. So they lost about eight seconds during their pit stop exchange yesterday, which was frustrating for Carl Marcelli because he had a very fast car as he worked his way back through the field. And there we go. That is that white number 80 in the hands of Marcelli, leading Pro-Am, second overall, but leading Pro-Am. And that black Ferrari behind him is Crisoni. And we'll have to see just what's unfolding in terms of lap times this time, because this is as close as we have seen Crisoni easily for a while. See him there dancing on the brakes there, really threshold breaking down into that brake zone for turn 12, so he can see the carrot right in front of him. He's going to try and chase down Marcelli here before we get to that pit stop window, which opens here in about six minutes. Mandatory pit stop for tire change, driver change, somewhere between the 40 and 50 minute mark of this race. Not always necessarily the leader will be the first car to pit. As soon as the clock hits that mark, anyone can hit pit lane. 
and the uh, time that they've mandated for that uh, minimum pit stop window was 70 seconds for the GT category. Right? 80 seconds, I believe, Greg, 80 seconds to get the stop done. Okay. And you should be able to do that uh, if everything goes smoothly with a little bit of time to spare. That's kind of how the concept is, but one hiccup with belts, one hiccup with uh, refueling rig, one hiccup with a, a, a air gun, that can go away in a hurry. It really can, and there was a little bit more pressure. They tightened up the <laughs> stop window last year, which meant if you had any issues, you're outside of it. So it really kept everyone up on their toes in pit lane. But it still has to be executed. Anything goes wrong, you're going to be immediately outside of that. And as you can see, as close and competitive as this field is this year, that will cost you track position. We're back covering this battle because Marcelli responded to Cressoni in that last lap, ran about three tenths quicker, and opened that margin up again just a little bit. And uh, boy, Ryan Dial is up on the wheel right now. He is. He's really keeping the pressure on. He's not been feeling well this weekend, so I'm earlier in the weekend. He said, "Don't get too close." He said, "I'm not feeling great." So sometimes when you get the helm on, get behind the wheel, all of those ill feelings go away, and it's just a pressure charge situation for you, and you get the job done. Well, adrenaline is amazing short-term medicine. It certainly is. <laughs> Let's see whether he's able to do anything here in the next four and a half minutes. Any opportunity you have to be in front of any competitor you can going into that pit stop window is a good opportunity. So I'm sure he will be as aggressive as he possibly can be to try and get around Rodrigo Baptista here in that number one Hublo Ferrari. Today's coverage is brought to you in partnership with Lamborghini, with Mercedes AMG, and with Porsche. Now there's a look at the margins. You just saw Hinman out of screen at the bottom. Here comes Marcelli in second, Crisoni, the black Ferrari in third. They head up into turn one, make that climb. Cassoni has got the bit between his teeth. He was the fastest man on the racetrack last tour around, so he can see the accurate. He wants to at least close in on that gap as they hit pit lane for this uh, mandatory pit stop. Pit stop will happen sometime in the next three to 13 minutes. That's where the window is going to open up here. So you look at the clock, so he is going to chase him down as he gets a little bit closer. Yes, there's the aero effect, but it'll also get the draft effect down these long straightaways here. Maybe I'll get closer to that accurate before this round of pit stops happens. Well, and you know, your first thought might be, well, the pit window opens in three minutes. Uh, you know, you've saved your tires to this stage. That's too little, too late. But for him, as you said, it could be, you know, 12 minutes. Uh, and now maybe uh, if he was just being real gentle on those Pirelli P zeros, thinks he can maybe do something here. And even if Marcelli were to pit a bit sooner than uh, Cressoni, if your tires are still in good shape, with nobody in front of you, and you can throw down a couple of really quick flyers uh, and stay out, that's what they call the overcut, right? It is, but uh, typically with the Pro-Am combination, yeah. you're gonna wanna try and keep your higher graded driver in a little bit longer, so they started the race today, so you expect these first rounds of pit stops to be a little bit later into that pit stop window for Hinman and uh, for Shelby Blackstock. I think Kinman's probably got the edge just based on his experience in the car over Shelby, but Shelby's very quick as he proved yesterday, so we'll be curious to see how that silver-silver combination cuts the cake here this afternoon. So there is that battle for the lead in the Pro-Am category for second overall, essentially. And uh, yeah, Ryan Dial uh, within now half a second again of Baptiste and Bleakamol in about the same distance as well. So a couple of really stout battles unfolding on this track. Seems like Crisoni is just getting a little bit closer each lap. Just under a second now, the gap to the Acura in front of him. He'll be happy with this run as a very solid performance from the front row. Got jumped a little bit there at the start on the run up into this corner, turn one, but he's got the hammer down. He's kept the pressure on. He's kept the gap right there, which will give his team and his teammate the ability to try and do something with it. Flowing down through two, and here is that run into three in these S's. And three, four, five, so every corner tightens up. Seven is extremely tight, and then eight is a big hook back. 
through a very tight turn nine. So once you get behind in your input a little bit, you can really lose time through this section of track easily and quickly. Trent Hinman, though, up front, continuing to ease away, keeping that margin up there now. He just continues to clock out these low 206s, Cal. Everybody else dicing in the mid-206, 207 range, and Hinman, just like clockwork, is putting these laps in. Now, he's going to be coming up in the back of Greg Leofoge in the number 87, Stephen Cameron Racing, BMW of San Francisco. BMW, and... Uh, Obviously, you want to be able to get through there fairly clean, not lose any time. But he's got enough of a margin that he can do it uh, with a bit of circumspection. He certainly can. And we don't expect too many of these pros diving into the pit lane as soon as that pit lane window opens. But for Marcelli, he may be the first driver to get it. Hitman's going to be very tight to where he hits pit lane when that 50-minute mark winds down here. I heard Martin Barkey say in that interview with Ryan that... Uh, and we witnessed it last year, too, that uh, this track really seems to suit the Acura or vice versa, however you want to put it. What do you think? What do you think is the reason that the Acura is so good here? Well, I think it likes a nice, smooth track, and I think uh, the real key last year was keeping that front platform and the ride height under control. And when they could do that, they got consistency with the turning and the understeer would be uh, erased. And I think with the smoother race surface this year, I think it's even come more into their hands. Watching now, seeing what, uh, every time Grissoni gets up to a certain point here, Marcelli responds. He did it again and has now put two more tenths on it. And uh, Guy Cosmo right behind Alan Metney now as they come out of that turn 11 here. And uh, Cosmo, we've talked about it, extremely experienced, very, very fast. But those cars are quite equal. And now Cosmo trying to get deep on the brakes. And Metney, he's been wheeling this Porsche. He's doing a great job. I was actually over by the KPAX group and a guy was talking to Darren Law, program director there at KPAX Bentley, and just uh, saying they've been looking at the data and they've been just trying to figure out why they're struggling with the front end of this Bentley hard into the brake zones. They're talking about ABS, maybe the car's too low, so they've just been trying to do some subtle adjustments to get this car dialed in. But you can see it right there. He's just not got the confidence in the car to be able to make that move on Bentley down into the brake zone there in turn 12. For a minute there, it looked like he was going to try and go to the outside. Metney saw that coming. Now, let's see if Guy will square up, try and get the drive down underneath. Well, couldn't do it there. Metney's done a really nice he job is. by keeping Guy at bay here. So you can see the pit window is open. Yeah, he's doing a superb job. And the thing is, I mean, these cars are, you know, with the balance of performance, over a lap, they have very similar performance. Uh, and that's by design. Now, Cosmo that time got a pretty good drive and he gets through, see if he can hang on to it here at the exit. What I was getting at is that Porsche with the engine uh, over the drive wheels plants the power so well. Coming out of the tighter corners, sometimes that is just enough to dissuade anybody from being able to get through, but Cosmo finally makes that pass stick. Looking at him and there, dies for pit lane from the lead. Had the hammer down on the lap before, 2062, about eight tenths <laughs> clear of the wow. rest of the field on that last lap before he hits pit lane. Whatever rubber he had left, he was definitely not shy and using it up there on his in-lap. No, he is such an, uh, and it just, to this day, it just boggles my mind. We've been calling his name for so many years, and he's 23. Wow. And so good. Out he gets. There he is, and Shelby Blackstock will be getting on board. Two mechanics, one wheel gun allowed to do this mandatory four tire change, so it should give the drivers plenty of time to get this uh, driver exchange done. And again, 80 seconds is the minimum time that they could spend on pit lane. Not surprisingly, Rich Beck has ducked in. He'll be turning over to Mark Issa. Both of them coming out of Ferrari Challenge in that number six machine. We'll see how that turns out here. Clock is on for Hinman. Turning over to Blackstock. Starts and just go. I'm not sure if he is being told one thing on the radio and the mechanic was signaling another thing because you could hear him on the rev limiter and you see all the mechanic pointing him out. So we'll yeah. see how this one shakes out. Only thing I think it was was that mechanic doing a count, you know, that was being done over the radio as well, but that's confusing. Yeah, and they're well outside, four and a half seconds yeah. outside of the minimum. So there was a delay there. So 
That yeah. could be crucial. I mean, some of these other teams can execute, and depending on what sort of traffic Shelby hits on his outlap, maybe that'll tighten up the gap at the front. And when they pitted, he had uh, about a seven second lead, so. With the tire wall, it's going to be interesting to see how the lap times compare between well worn rubber, yes. obviously warm rubber on the drivers that are staying out, and Shelby Blackstock on fresh Pirelli P0s coming out of the tire rockets. In the past, typically the outlaps were very poor in comparison with the hot rubber laps in terms of the overcut. Decided to keep Marcelli out there a little bit longer. These are pivotal laps in this race potentially for the number 80 squad. I mean, this is, and you've got to drop the hammer right now, don't you? Oh, you can't get it back. There's no <laughs> going back and grabbing those laps, so <laughs> the message will have been sent entirely. You can see what these last laps are. Dial coming in. So he brings that machine in, seventh in class. So Marcelli continuing to run low seven laps, 207.2 on the last lap. So for Shelby Blackstock, he has to get up on the wheel and start to cut some times immediately as soon as he gets the tire pressures up into the sweet spot. David Askew jumping aboard the number 63, DXDT Mercedes AMG. Got a lot of seat time during the winter, just really trying to fine tune his craft. Made a lot of progress over the last couple of seasons, Greg. Yeah, he really has. And that winter fest that the uh, series created at the uh, Thermal Club in California, I think it was a great idea. It was You had to be a bronze-rated driver. It was strictly for that. And it was an opportunity to go work on racecraft, work on speed, work on whatever you needed to and get ready for a season. And Ryan Dial said one of the things we worked on was managing the race weekend stresses. And one of the reasons for that, you go, well, it isn't that, you know, if you it, you're racing, you're going to have those. It's like, yeah, but David Askew owns the team and he's got a customer program in the 04 car. There's a lot going on in that very capable mind of David Askew. And I think that's what Ryan was alluding to is being able to, when it, it's time to switch on the driving, be able to do that. Yeah, everything else has to go out of your head and just focus on the job and the task at hand. So uh, that's what they've been working on. Well, Crisoni is really keeping the pressure on here. It's going to take a, an awesome pit stop by the Racers Edge Group and the 80 squad to not allow the TR3 machine to uh, leapfrog around here. Staying out a little bit long, as you can see, another three and a half minutes on the board. So I think next time by, they're going to have to hit pit lane. We'll not get two more laps without running afoul of that. You don't have to have the service completed with 40 minutes to go, but at least have broken the plane into pit lane. What did we see for lap times on that one? A 207-1, a 206-8 by Cassoni, and in comes Baptista. And he will be turning over to Martin Fuentes. This is a very even driver pairing as well. Yes, Martin coming off three GTM titles in the last four years, and he's always been a bullet in one of these Ferraris. Rodrigo has done a nice job here this weekend. He won here last year with Capex in the opening round of the championship. We now focus on this battle, which is for the overall lead right now. I'm waiting to see what Blackstock is doing. As we start to see some lap times from him up here in comparison to the 207s that the leaders have been cutting. The all to ask you, that was a good stop, a 21-21-3, so 1.3 seconds. Uh-oh. I hope that they got that service done so fast that they had that amount of time to sit. Blackstar's opening lap, Greg, was a 208.7, so... Again, that's cutting into that gap. They lost four and a half seconds with the pit stop exchange potentially and lost uh, just shy of two seconds on that outlap for Shelby Blackstock. How good was that Squadra Corsa TR3 stop? A nine tenths over the minimum and he sat there for a while. They got that stop done extraordinarily quick. They can be for positions. These yeah. uh, pit stops that are executed to that level that can make a huge difference in the overall running order once everyone cycles through here. You're going to see these drivers diving for pit lane. This will go through. will come out of 19, immediately cut across. Just maximizing that speed right up to that cone right there. 
and 50 kilometers an hour. Feels like you're standing still when you're crawling down pit lane, haven't been out on the racetrack at full speed. And this is rush hour now as every one of the pros in the Pro-Am that we're still on track are in. It'll be fascinating to watch this one unfold here, how these stops go. And any real hiccup here is going to cost you some serious time. Sony out. Ziad Gondor in. There's Blackstock. Well, he's going to get, be getting his probably P0s right in at their sweet spot. They came out of the tire oven, so they had a little bit of temperature. But now he's starting to run. Oh, quick spin there by one of the vital speed Ferraris. That was the number six. I think that was Marquisa who had just taken over for Rich Beck. Just couldn't quite get into the rhythm early enough and has a little mistake there, unfortunately. And... Like they had their stop done fairly well timed, and this is going to be just crucial watching this group here. Here goes the 24 of Gondor. We'll watch and see. Here he comes. This is Barky. Where are they on the out time? Well, look where this Perfect. Here comes Blackstock. It's going look to be really that. tight up into the break zone. So Barky has a little bit of tire temperature, but Shelby just swings around the outside. It was that close. What he needed was a couple more seconds to play with and just hold him up through the S's. But for Blackstock, pivotal moment that he is able to clear him and just get on his way. It's going to take Barkey a few corners and a couple of laps to really get the sweet spot of his tires and car back into the fold. Gander under pressure. Quirts now putting the pressure on here as they tiptoe their way around this racetrack on the opening corners. Yeah, George taking over from Colin Brown and a very good stop. But Westfall to Trevor Beckel. 9.3 seconds too long. And Bleak of Mullen to uh, Sophronis, 18 seconds too long. That's, I mean, this was a team that really had a shot at this Pro-Am win with James's experience and speed. And that's gonna hurt. It really will. So you see pit window is now closed. Everyone has been on pit lane, so there shouldn't be any issues there. Now question everyone settling back in. Up front, Shelby Blackstock. Going for his second consecutive victory on his GT3 debut weekend. Still a race's edge, 1-2 right now. So pit stops are done, timing will cycle, and soon we will know just how this played out in terms of the pit window. And right off the bat, George Kurtz is Really putting some pressure here on Ziad uh, Gondor. Have to see whether he's able to do anything here. Ziad sensing what's coming and trying to drive as cleanly defensive as he possibly can. But you start doing that, of course, and you tend to slow down because you're tightening up all your radiuses, not flowing the speed. Kurtz has a run here. He might be able to do something with it. Kind of a late move by Ziad. Ooh. That was super tight. Yep. George had to almost park at their apex, and suddenly Schmidt has to take evasive action as they come off a of turn 20. Be curious to see what the stewards think about that one. Was that initiated, that move to the inside of the, the road by Kurtz first, and was it in reaction by Ziad? And coming up those shallow approaches, doesn't he, Greg? Particularly he really in does. the opening laps until he's comfortable with the race car. Yep. did that yesterday. Yeah, at any of the key corners, 111, we saw him doing that. And that little exchange, bottling everybody up, and that's given Fuentes, who uh, was back a little bit to this battle, is coming on with a huge head of steam here. And reeling in Henry Schmidt. And I think Martin's got all of the speed and the ability to get that car up on the overall podium. So watch for that Hoblo Ferrari to start to make some moves here. This is turn 10. Really quick sweeper, uh-oh. Schmidt just moves out of the way. I think he's just doing that to allow Martin the clear path through. Again, Ziad really wide there, struggling to get that Ferrari up to speed. Kurtz has to take evasive action, and Martin swings through that corner at maximum speed. And they're punching the hole in the air between them, running side by side in front of him. Yeah, absolutely, and I think that was a class move by Schmidt because they've had that incident early. They've been in the pits. They're down a few laps and uh, just let him go. Now Kurtz late, late, late on the brakes, and Gondor 
wanted to try and turn in, and Kurtz it just parked him a little bit. And that little bit of a juke has cost uh, Gondor a little bit of momentum, and that is going to allow Fuentes to really come after him and mount a bit of an attack. And we'll see how that plays out here. Heading through turn number 14 and 15. George Kurtz taking the crowd strike, DXDT Mercedes around Ziad Gondor and has picked up the lead. And here's how it happened, folks. Down on the inside for turn 20. This attempt was thwarted, as you can see. Yep. Ziad just squeezes him there. Watch out to uh, get defensive and then a little bit of a battle right here down in another break zone. Ziad just runs a little bit wide and coming off of turn 11. It's an acceleration run down the back straightaway and George makes the move. Gets it done right, right there. You see Ziad really wanted to turn in and I think George has stayed put to make sure Ziad couldn't do the cut under move. That was a really savvy piece of driving and oh no. Uh, that is uh, the car that Metney started. That's David Ducote who was off into the gravel. I don't know, Cal, that's a little bit of a, a couple of different theories you could operate on whether that's a safe enough area to leave that car right now. Yeah, I mean, it's high speed there through the yes, S's, it is. so we don't typically see a lot of uh, full course yellows here at Circuit of the Americas, but I would assume that he's beached there in that gravel trap. If he's unable to move, there's a lot of time on this clock to uh, have that car sit there. Bobble there by Ziad. He's struggling to get the uh, car into the window that he likes to operate in right now. It's an interesting story. Uh, recently here in North America, he's done Ferrari Challenge and uh, is very quick in Ferrari Challenge, to be sure. But uh, he has a... Uh, <laughs> Ziad has done uh, racing, uh, road racing and GT3 Cup and the like over in the Middle East. But earlier... He did some rallying and somehow over there picked up the nickname Z-Hog. And uh, he seems to be okay with people calling him that. Gets a big smile on his face. Probably generates some great memories, I would think. Uh, but uh, let's go down to the pits now. Ryan Marine, we saw the problem for that number six Ferrari. Let's check in about it, Ryan. Unfortunately, it's turned into a terminal problem. Marquis had joining us here on pit lane. We'd rather see you out there in these beautiful yellow Ferrari of yours. Uh, can you take us through what happened? Yeah, I mean, I think if you watch it, you'll probably know better than I even do. You're going through a corner at such a high speed, looking for a straightaway, looking for an opportunity to gain and gain and gain. And uh, sometimes that throttle is ahead of the rubber. So uh, you come around and such a soft hit. I was really sure that everything was going to be OK. Drove it in just to make sure. And the team told me it's better not to keep going. Uh, it's a really exciting program. Two cars from this final speed team. I know this isn't the ideal way to get things started, but there's still a lot to be excited for this year. Hey, uh, sometimes rock bottom teaches you what mountaintops won't. I mean, at the end of the day, you got to have some progression, and if this is where the beginning is, I can't wait to see the end. A little philosophy for Mark Easton today. <laughs> Thank you, Mark. All right, man. Woo! Let's do it. Yeah, he is just phenomenal energy. Just an absolutely great character. Loves what he's doing. Very passionate. And it's uh, great to see him make this step. And uh, yeah, there's a lot of, he was going to have a lot of rear stick on that car if he continued with it. But uh, yeah, it's going to be a fun program. No question of that. We have a full course yellow has been called. And this is what happened to David Ducote. And uh, that's one of those things. That, as you said, it's faster, Cal, and one car can get there, another one can. And they've decided to go take care of that at this point. And that is uh, unfortunate, but hopefully they'll be able to get him. He did not have any sort of contact. He'll be able to get back out and be able to uh, drive off, albeit a little bit further behind this very, very stout field at Circuit of the Americas. Today's coverage is brought to you in partnership with AWS, with CrowdStrike, and with Optima Battery. As we continue under full course caution here at Circuit of the Americas, uh, obviously needed to do it uh, to get that taken care of, but this puts a whole different perspective on this race now because 
all those gaps are going to be gone and, uh, with these drivers. And I think the team that may be benefiting uh, the most out of this is that uh, blue and white with the orange wing Porsche in the back there. Yeah, because they had a horrendous pit stop. I'm not sure when arrived there with the GMG group on that pit stop. They lost 18 seconds there. So this definitely put James Safronis back in the mix. He's got a lot of work to do. He's got a lot of cars to pass to get yes. up into the podium position, but uh, certainly reshuffles the pack here a little bit. I think Martin Fuentes has a very fast race car. He's currently fourth overall on the road, as you can see, fourth car back behind this NSX pace car. Uh, so I'm sure he's licking his chops at this restart opportunity. Yes. And uh, going back to that interview with Issa, that uh, uh, that first thing answering uh, Ryan's question, where you talk about you try and gain, you gain, you're looking for that, you're trying to gain. It's a long way of saying he got greedy <laughs> with <laughs> yes. the throttle. Yeah. But that's what a racer does. Is uh, he, he was absolutely right on that. And uh, it's a learning process. He oh. a lot of time in Ferrari Challenge, and the GT3 machine is a totally different animal. And particularly when you're out there on the initial laps, even though you got the tire warmers, uh, you just can't go full ball like you can once you've uh, got a bit more pressure in at those tires. So it's a learning process, and I'm sure we'll come back and uh, a lot wiser from this experience. Well, and, you know, the Ferrari Challenge cars are very fast, very powerful and the like, but they don't have anywhere near the uh, the downforce. And we talked to Issa last year when he made a couple of starts. He said, this is such a completely different animal. And when you're at speed and you're into the arrow and the downforce on those cars, uh, and I've called it in the past, I call it false grip, because uh, you're not supposed to be able to go that fast and that arrow's working. When it goes, and you ask that little bit more of it, it goes. Yes, it does. Yeah. And uh, you just got to uh, manage that. It's all about feeling the grip. That's why the great drivers, the ones who have that little edge and make the difference, can feel that last percentage of grip and know when to use it and not step over the mark. So everybody gathered up here behind the safety vehicle. Thanks to Acura and that NSX GT3 road car. And oh, this is interesting. That looks maybe just like a tire pressure change, possibly for James Safronis. And if he can get right to the back of that pack once again, although he didn't want to give away track position, that's for sure. Interesting. All right, looks like they've got David Ducote's car extracted and he is able to drive off and continue on here. So once that EV vehicle clears the track, we ought to be able to get back to Green Flagger. One more time, take a look at what happened to David. Yeah, just got lost it through there, high speed S's. Um, May have just lifted a little bit, got some weight on the nose, got the arrow pinned, and uh, suddenly the rear run came around on him. He doesn't have a ton of time, and uh, as you mentioned earlier this weekend, he was sitting home not anticipating driving here this weekend. Got the last minute call from Alan Mentley to join him aboard this Porsche, so that's a tough road. I mean, you're excited to be back, but you're certainly thrown in at the deep end. That and the fact that, you know, he doesn't, rarely has he ever been able to run a full season program because of other things, so it's not like he's out there driving all the time and able to deal with it. And, uh, yeah, he told me, he said, I got the call from, uh, uh, from Metney, and he said, what are you doing this weekend? He said, I don't know any plans. He goes, well, get off the sofa and let's go racing. And he said, all right, let's do that. Uh, we just saw uh, a moment ago a uh, pit stop here from this number 14 machine, and it uh, didn't look like they were doing anything other than possibly changing some air pressures on that car. And that's fine because uh, if they feel they got a little imbalance, they can correct with that tire pressure adjustment. Brad Kettler's leading the charge over there. So much experience, six Le Mans victories during his uh, career uh, directing uh, programs at Le Mans. And they had poor track position. That brings him in. He can get a little bit faster race car. So didn't really lose too much. And also, he's getting a nice hot lap here before you're back to green to clean those tires off and uh, be ready to go. Uh, and James is certainly capable uh, in terms of his speed and putting it together. When the AM drivers of the Pro-Am pairing did the qualifying for yesterday's race, he put it on pole. So he certainly has some speed here. And that Acura NSX safety car. It's interesting, the sort of a new approach here to the last lap of these uh, yellow periods is the, I said the safety car is going to seriously pick the pace up and get going so that when you guys come to green, you're going to be able to really be moving already. And it'll be interesting to see Blackstock and Barkey in those two Acuras, what happens down into turn number one with Kurt Fuentes on their six. This should be fun, Cal. It should, and watch <laughs> for that fourth car in lane. Martin Fuentes, he needs to time this jump off the final corner, see if he can make a move on George Kurtz up into turn one. 
And there it goes. Blackstock read it beautifully, rolled into it. And they said it, it right after the apex of 20, you can go. It looks like Fuentes did get a decent little run on Kurtz. Kurtz has to defend. He goes down to the inside. Patrick Byrne way down to the inside. I think he might just have uh, been able to go and contact. Damage. Uh, that's damage. That is one of the vital speed cards. That would be the number seven of Trevor Beck. And uh, that's some pretty significant damage there to that left rear corner. Yeah, it's going to be another yellow, I think, Greg. Good. I don't think he's going to be able to move that car yeah. to a safe haven yeah, very no easily. Way. Oh, that's frustrating because he had really had himself in pretty decent place here. Fifth in Pro-Am for Trevor and an opportunity. Such a difficult turn one, particularly yeah. when you get a restart like that. It's a funneling effect and everyone's aggressive up on the wheel. They realize there's not a lot of time left on the clock, so maybe not as much patience shown on a restart late in the going as to the initial start. Meanwhile, these drivers continue to run. They haven't called the yellow yet. They're still very much on the attack. Martin Fuentes looked for a good exit there off of turn 11. Curse immediately defends, goes to the inside lane down this back straightaway. What can Fuentes do in the whole blue Ferrari? Well, if he pops back to his right, and Kurtz not so, oh, and he decides, he faints that way and then jumps down to the inside, leads on the brakes, and he's through. Nice job by Martin. Really controlled up beautifully. Fortunately, the two NSXs up ahead of him were well clear of the apex, so he didn't have any issues there trying to gauge that. Really intrigued here because that car, a Beck right in the middle of the exit, of blind exit at turn number one. And uh, did he manage to limp that off somehow? Well, I think they'll probably let these guys race through to about 19, turn 20, and then make the call. Okay. Give them plenty of time, even if the car's still stranded there. They've certainly been on the radio. Every team has to monitor race control radio. They may well have said there could be. The car be ready. moved a little bit further down the track, just looking oh, at yeah. the uh, screen that we have here. We call it the moving ants, which displays the positioning of the cars around the racetrack. So full course yellow. There it is. He moved it, but not that much. Boy, and I'll tell you, two cars that this has played into beauty. Again, Martin Fuentes. Now, that margin that he had lost to those two cars up front, he's right back in that mix when we go back to green flag. And unfortunately for Sophronis, that hot lap to catch the field, that's kind of gone away. You had talked about, uh, Cal, that Sophronis with that stop and that apparent tire adjustment, when they went back to green, he was going to have that almost full lap of being able to really get those tires up to temp. Well, that's kind of gone away now, and he'll be in the same position as everybody. He will, but um, looks like he's made a move around Burn there. He's got around the Bentley. That car, that Bentley's got damage now. It was the one, I think, that uh, collected the uh, oh, okay. number seven of Beck. Gotcha. And you can see, yeah, the hood's gone. And that's going to happen. I mean, he was so far down on that restart to... Uh, his left over almost into the pit lane exit area trying to make that move and Beck was up on the outside as they went up there's no way Beck sees him and starts his turn in no, you're just completely out of the side view mirror and you can't really feel a car that's that far away from you so just a difficult corner yeah. uh, on a start and on the restarts it's just they all come together and you're just hoping that you give each other enough racing room to make it through just not the weekend that Patrick Byrne and Guy Cosman were looking for. No, nope. I think for those drivers, it's uh, been both educational and a little character building. And there is the uh, hood off of that Bentley Continental GT3. Once they, yep, I was going to say there's going to be an EV crew responding to the Ferrari, but they'll probably send one to grab that big piece of bodywork. Like get that back to the Capex crew, so. So there's three Acuras at the front. One is a pace car. <laughs> three different classes uh, of those Acuras up front. Pace car, silver, pro-am. And uh, for Martin Barkey, I'll be curious to see what he does on this restart. Um, he looked pretty racy there with Shelby on that initial go around. But how much will he risk the class victory going for the overall win? All right, well, let's get down to Ryan, who has found Guy Cosmo, Patrick Burns' teammate, in that Bentley. Yes, that's right, Greg. Uh, Guy Cosmo standing beside me in pit lane. It's been an up-and-down weekend, safe to say. You had a chance to see what happened on track a moment ago. What did you make of it, and, and where do you guys go from here? 
Yeah, talk about a rough start, man. We've been so excited about running with K-Pax and Bentley this season. Such a great team and a, and a great manufacturer. This car has been proven so well, but man, we are just, we are so far off our mark this weekend. Really doing our best to try to do what we can to make improvements and plan for already for the next races. So yeah, there, you know, Patrick looked like he was down inside and his report was that uh, all of a sudden the yellow Ferrari just made a, a really sharp turn to back down to the apex and you know, they came together pretty at a pretty sharp angle there. So really unfortunate, feel bad for the vital speed guys. And uh, we've got some damage, we're evaluating to see if we have to pit him or not. Sorry to see it, thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Ryan. Full course caution continuing here at Circuit of the Americas as we have the Accurate NSA safety. Here's another look at it. There's Burn way down to the inside, and there comes Trevor. Yeah, and it's just, um, it's going to happen now and again up into turn one. It's a very unique corner, a lot of elevation change, and there you see the hood fly from the Bentley a little bit later after the contact. And he just comes from a very different approach from each side of the racetrack. And it wasn't like an egregious move, but no. unfortunately, uh, you just get down to the inside there, and it's totally. Beck's ability to go for the apex. He can't really see you down to the inside unless he's got a spotter up there telling him what's going on. So you can see the massive damage to the front end of this Bentley. Yeah, that was a pretty substantial hit for the amount of damage it leveled on that Ferrari. It was going to do the same to this Bentley. And uh, the problem is, is you're thinking, well, you know, it was so close. Couldn't Patrick have got out of it a little bit. Well, he may have already been trying to do just that. We saw that flash of yellow coming across, but uh, you can only do so much once you've already committed to the corner at the speed you're at. Yeah, it seems like you've got acres of room and suddenly it all disappears on you in a hurry. And uh, that's just experience too. I mean, Patrick hasn't done a ton of uh, races here at Circuit of the Americas, so, um, you know, it's just, it's just unfortunate. I mean, it's just a weekend that has not gone their way, whatever they try. We saw Guy get into trouble, turning Leofuge a little bit. Patrick got turned yesterday. And I think they're running at a position in the pack that they weren't anticipating. As we look at program manager Darren Law, they're kind of shaking his head. Can't believe that this weekend has gone down the road that it has. Well, and I think that's one of those learning uh, opportunities here. Those, what do they call them, a teachable moment? that I'm sure Guy and, uh, and a team manager with as much driving experience as Darren has uh, for Patrick will say, and we've heard Stewards, Chief Steward say this in very, you know, many series, you've got to remember to present yourself in mirrors when you're going to make a pass because if you're so far off to a side where nobody can see you in their mirrors, there's no way sometimes these things don't happen. And uh, he'll learn from that. He will. I mean, he will. He's an Asian Le Mans prototype or yeah an Asian Le Mans series prototype champion I mean he's got the chops it's just this is an adjustment oh Patrick is very good it's just uh, one of these weekends that whatever they seem to do they find themselves in the wrong place at the wrong time so a uh, guy has a lot of experience he, he he'll work with Patrick here over the next few weeks and uh, make sure that they come back a little bit strong and I think you know listening to the group uh, chat here at lunchtime before the office afternoon guy just said we need a test we need to get out there and just get this car dialed in yeah, but it doesn't help. I mean, with all of his experience in the leg to not have any time in this car until the first test day, essentially, that they had on Thursday for Guy, uh, once he gets his uh, his hands around that a little bit, and you know that he and Darren will work with that crew and those engineers, and they will have a weapon come the next race. Oh, they will. You look at their experience. They've had 59 wins in the <laughs> challenge competitions, four championships, been on the podium 148 times. So you don't luck into that. All right, we are looking forward to going green this time. Lights out on the Acura NSX safety vehicle. The two Acura NSX GT3s behind it are rolling into the throttle. And let's see if Barky's able to stay a little closer here to Blackstock. And not really. Shelby really getting the job done here. And I wonder if you weren't spot on. That Bar last thing Barky wants to do is uh, get in an incident with these two cars. He's got his own class race he's going to be really concerned with primarily here. And uh, it's a good plan. But the uh, problem for Barky, I think, might be that big number one that's looming in the background here that might get a little closer here. Yeah, Martin, I saw a little puff of smoke there as he ended turn 20, so he is trying to get a really good launch off that final corner, but just got a little bit uh, wrong with the tires cooling off there under the safety uh, period behind the, the safety car. So he's got to regroup here a little bit. 
So he was having a really great run as the number 20 car. Fred Pordad behind the wheel. Remember, they had to make that unscheduled stop to tighten up the seatbelts for Max Root. Mike Lotus have done a great job, got that car up to the lead in AM once again and six overall. Yeah, kept him on the lead lap, and that has paid big dividends with these cautions. And here comes Sofronis now, trying to make the move on David Askew down into turn number 11. He's got 16 minutes to work with, but he's had a fast race car all weekend long. He has the experience. He's got to get his head down and see how much ground he can make up. Absolutely, and uh, did what he needed to there in terms of getting through and then positioning the car so that Askew couldn't do a counter move. And now Sofronis will come up on the back of the fellow Porsche, the, but the other one is in the right motorsports colors, and Fred Pordad is James in the GMG machine, of course. And we'll see what he's able to do here and how quickly he can do it. So the two guys were really kind of eyeballing right now in a sense as Fuentes on Barky right here, and uh, Sofronis now on Pordad. What they can do in this final 15 and a half minutes, essentially. Not bad you're looking at there. That is the lead in Pro-Am, followed by Fuentes and Kurtz. That's your Pro-Am podium right now. Will it change position, though? All right, and they are right now covered by the proverbial blanket here at Circuit of the Americas. Today's coverage is brought to you in partnership with Pirelli, with Rebellion timepieces, and with Total. That battle continues. Barkey finding a little bit of room here over Fuentes as they head down through two, now into these S's. And it's just a matter of being able to float speed. Well, I'll tell you, Martin Closes it up big time here as they get now up into this really tricky section here through turn five, six. This is turn eight. They're going to be heading into. Did he get the run he needs? Because if he can carry some speed through this really quick kink and make a move down into 11, and Barky was able to get through there fairly well, Cal. Oh, he, and look at Kurtz ooh, going for them both. Late. That wow. was late. I'm not sure if that was intentional or not. He just left it super late. Oh. All this contact coming up between all three cars. And that has allowed Fuentes to move on through. And it looked like he was going to even be a little bit better than that until that contact kind of forced Barky over and almost collected Martin. So now he's just got to stay on it here. What can he do down into turn number 12? And he's going to make it stick. Was there any damage to yes. any of those three cars there coming off? They all sandwiched together there momentarily for George. I think he just missed his braking point by about a car length, but managed to initially avoid contact, and then as they accelerated away, they all kind of concertina together. Is there any damage to these cars? Did any tire get cut down in that incident? Martin is scampering away, isn't he? I was he? just going to say, once he got to the front, and again, we talk about the aero sensitivity of these cars. You get in some clean air, and you've got the skill set that Martin does. And look at Kurt's going to try and come up underneath on Barkey now and slices through. And here comes Gondor. Oh, he is if, uh, racing. Martin has a problem here. Yeah, from that contact. Look at Blake and Nolan. He's loving what he's seeing. All this argy bargy up in front of him has allowed him to catch up here. Yeah, it looks like in a. Car Barkey's is looking okay here. Sophronis looked and tucks back in. Looks again. Tries to square up. All right, we got uh, word that he's talked to the team, and apparently there may be some damage. Yeah, he just doesn't seem to have the car underneath him. Look oh. at that one with a touch. Big that contact was... there between Fred Pordad making a move around the slowing Barkey, and they all came together there in turn three. That almost collected the fort. It may have been a touch even with Sophronis, but he may have got away with it. Boy, things have suddenly gone off the charts here at Circuit of the Americas. Lots of action unfolding while we have been green flag racing after that last caution. Lots of things changing, Cal. 
It all happened here down in turn 11 with a big move by George Kurtz down at the inside. There was contact coming off between him, Barkey and Fuentes. Fuentes has got around. He's now got the lead in Pro-Am second overall on the road. And then coming through the S's, high speed contact with the right Motorsports Porsche involved. And there is a little, maybe a touch on this car as well. We've got to see how that car is. You can see lots of debris around this racetrack right now. And uh, it's like Sofronis, looks like the car is working okay at this stage. He is going to be the number 20 car, is he yes. in a safe zone? No, oh, he's backing it into a safe zone, if he can. All right, this is where it all started, Cal. You can see there, I think George thought he's going to run into the back of the Ferrari, so he just dies for the apex, has to release the brake to do so, gets away with it, and as they come off, as he comes back on the racetrack, he gets into the side of Martin Barkey, who then gets into the side of Fuentes. I think Barkey's car must have sustained a little bit of damage with that move. And then Gondor here just making a huge move and gets by on Barkey. And as he came down the front straight, the crew said Barkey had some damage, and then this moment... Yeah, Bucky's oh. just not got the car underneath him, so he was slow. Poor Dad got a run on him, went to the outside, and just three into one doesn't go there. It's very tight through that entry to the high-speed S's. And uh, for Sofronis, he really escaped a huge moment, but he's now on pit lane. Did he cut down a tire as well? That was a big clock on that right front corner, that contact on Sofronis. When Poor Dad hit the 80 here and then came right across James' nose, you can see it's like at least a cut tire possibly for Barkey. Some smoke coming off, and usually that's the bodywork laying down on the tire, possibly, when it's flat. And I think thinking back about that move by George Kurtz down into turn 11, I just think he was worried about running into the back of Martin Fuente, so he had to duke to the outside, probably to release the brake pressure. And he would have been fine if he just kept it straight coming off the corner, but when he kind of inched his way back on, there wasn't enough room. And going right to that left front. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And I mean, you know, these cars have ABS, but as you've said many times, Cal, that it isn't a panacea. And at a certain point, you get in too hot and they have too much pressure, that pedal, but it, it almost goes numb. The only way you get feel back is to release it, right? Yeah, you just got to bleed out of the brake pressure to try and get it back underneath you. Well, that Racer's Edge crew ready. But with that now, we've got Shelby Blackstock with a sizable lead overall in this field of almost five seconds but martin fuentes has now picked up the lead in the pro-am category george kurtz in the zero four car right there george is hanging with yes, him now he is car must still be reg relatively healthy and she had gone to her a couple of seconds back but i gotta tell you i'm impressed with the aggressiveness of Ziad, and he's made some aggressive moves, Cal, but he's never hit anybody doing it. You know, and that's, you know, you know, there are a lot of drivers who'll come in and do something aggressive, uh, but it ends up in tears. And uh, he's been aggressive, but uh, seemingly a bit controlled in doing it, and that's an impressive sign. It really is. It's certainly going to shake out nicely as we uh, go through these six events this year on the championship trail to see what sort of progress he can make. And for Ziad, just to give you a little stat, coming out of Ferrari Challenge last year, he tied with Neil Gahani for the championship, if you will, in the Trofeo Pirelli AM category, as they call it. But it went to a tiebreaker. Gahani had a couple more wins, and that's what gave the championship. So Ziad has some chops, no question about it, and sits third in Pro-Am right now, chasing these two cars. Eight minutes to go in this one. And uh, now that things have settled a little bit, Fuentes and Kurtz able to run some laps a little bit quicker than Gondor is doing. I'm not sure if Martin's car is 100% healthy. I see my hair weird tire chatter through some of the cameras that we're listening to as they uh, roll around this race circuit. And uh, certainly Kurtz is hanging with him. But up front, it's all about Acura right now. Shelby Blackstock aboard that race's edge. Number 93 looking for their second victory of the weekend. And that was a sad shot, too, to see that number 14 Global Motorsports Group 511 Tactical Porsche in pit lane. No drivers around it, just parked. So it didn't look, you know, from the outside, we didn't see a whole lot of damage, but that doesn't mean it doesn't get into the uh, suspension on that right front corner. Apparently that's exactly what happened. And uh, I was hearing that, too, when you are talking about Martin's car. It doesn't seem to be hurting him too much in terms of pace right now. 
to critical seven minutes left as this is the battle for the win in Pro-Am. Yesterday, it was a reverse of these positions with uh, Brown and Kurtz oh. finishing second in Pro-Am and the uh, squad course at number one finishing third. So it's very tight in the points at the early stages of this season. And that last shot of the 14 explained maybe what happened. It wasn't so much the right front. That's where poor Dad first contacted, but he must have pancaked a little bit. He did some significant damage to the side and right rear of that car. So, unfortunately for James, all just a tremendous competitor over the almost the full 30 years of Pirelli World Challenge, and of course for Bleeka Mullen going after that uh, International Porsche Cup. This is not what he wanted to have happen here. Kurtz trying to chase down uh, Fuentes. Looks like Kurtz just floated a little bit wide there. Well, they're going to throw uh, everything out of by the kitchen sink here in these last few minutes of this race to try and uh, push for this victory. Yep, right around three laps left to go based on the clock here in terms of where Shelby Blackstock is leading overall in this battle for the Pro Am lead. Shelby Blackstock picking up where Trent Hinman left off, who picked up where Shelby Blackstock left off after yesterday's race up at the front and doing a fabulous job. But this is a very intriguing battle right now, isn't it, Cal? Because we know Martin was involved and nothing he did wrong in that uh, bit of contact up at turn 11. And the question is, is that Ferrari totally healthy? And Kurtz has just upped his racecraft this year and uh, he's really sticking with them. Yeah, and his car just looks to have better balance right now, better grips. I'm not sure of a consequence of the uh, contact that they had coming off of turn 11, but either way, I think Kurtz has a little bit stronger race car at this late stage of the game. And even though it's for second overall, it's still for the class win in Pro-Am, so both of these drivers are going to be pushing hard. They finished in reverse order yesterday with the 04 car just ahead of the number one, so it's tight on the points chart as well at the early stages of this season. Well, this is one of those scenarios where, you know, obviously Kurtz might be a little quicker right now. Fuentes would have the edge significantly in experience, certainly in these types of cars, and uh, which is going to be the uh, trump card, if you will, here. I think that Ferrari, gets once it gets out of the turns, it, it's still got some pretty good straight line. It just so, seems to be struggling a little bit through Apex compared yeah. to the Mercedes. You can kind of hear that tire squeal, so I'm not sure whether the toe is a little bit out in the... Uh, right rear of that Ferrari where he grabbed the contact. He starts to lean on it through that left-hander. These two have a fair amount of distance now between themselves and Gondor, so they're just gonna focus on this battle between themselves. David Askew sits in the fourth place in Pro-Am in the uh, team card of the 04, the 63 Salco Mercedes from DXDT Racing. And then Barkey after that stop to fix that left front tire to replace that tire, he's back out but well down the order at this stage. George Kurtz, super impressive here. I yes, was just he kind is. of uh, raised that moment out of his mind. He's still got his head down and hammer down, trying to chase down for this win here. And I think he's got potential to make it happen. Ferrari there just sneaks away a little bit down the straightaway compared to the Mercedes, but through the rest of the course, the Mercedes is super strong right now. It seems pretty evident that uh, in the corners in particular as you, oh, Kurtz got in a little deep there. I think he got close enough to that Ferrari on that run and again, lost a little of that air on the nose perhaps. Well, that's a similar thing to what happened down in turn 11. You're so deep on the brakes and you're just not quite sure if you're gonna stop in time enough so you continue to lean on the brake in that instance. I think in turn 11, he just got off the brake and just swung it to the inside to avoid contact. And this is where that racecraft and just gauging those uh, tight moments that's what it's all about is just learning that. So uh, George has to reset here, but he's running out of time. For where Shelby Blackstock is, he's coming through, and it's uh, too early on the clock right there to get the white flag. So he's got two laps to go. That's good news for Kurtz. He's going to have two laps to try and remount a challenge on Martin Fuentes. 
Shelby has been just impressive this weekend. Obviously, we've seen him a lot of success in uh, TCR machinery. We've seen him have success. Uh, he's done some, uh, certainly some open wheel racing and the like, but uh, he has really been impressive here in his debut in GT3. Let's look at Fred Porter. I'm amazed that car is driving. Well, I think they got it back out there to just try and get the car around, do a few more laps and grab this AM victory, following up on the AM victory yesterday for he and Max Rue. All about survival at this stage. Certainly been through the wars in day two here, that is for sure. That is indeed for sure. Maybe a little bit too much uh, contact for new race director Randy Hambry's uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, thoughts and uh, have to digest that. And uh, I think we might have a stricter driver's meeting at the next round of the championship. Here's that key run out of 11. And that's important because uh, if you can draw away a little bit here, which is exactly what Martin seems to be able to do, and that really puts you in a position to defend a little bit better for that last twisty bit sequence of corners. It seems to matter what combination Martin teams up with. He always seems to find victory lane, doesn't he? He does. So many victories over the last handful of years here. separate championships that he's won. And, uh, he and Baptista are certainly one of the early season favorites in this new Pro-Am category. Yeah, they have to be. Just, we know what Rodrigo's capable of in these GT3 cars in the pro level, and we know what we've seen Martin run very quick laps as well. But uh, right now, the story is about for the second straight day, Racer's Edge and this Acura Accelerated Services entry now in the hands of Shelby Blackstock. This new Silver Silver class, it's got some potential. It'll be interesting to see if we get some more takers in it. It really does, and I think that was John Maraki's thought process was through the winter season is just, uh, if we get a really solid Silver Silver lineup, can they potentially get that overall victory over a really strong Pro-Am lineup? He has one of those in his camp with Marcelli and Barkey. We certainly see it with Baptiste and Fuentes, but so far this weekend, Hidman, Blackstock, seem to have the magic ingredient to grab the wins. And on this last lap, it looks like Martin has maybe found a, a magic drive around to whatever problems he might be dealing with as he has stretched it out a little bit over Kurtz. And I also wonder if maybe Colin Brown isn't on the radio to George going, look, we won it yesterday. You know, we finished in front of them yesterday. Um, don't risk anything here and throw away second place point because we're going to be really close in this championship moving to the next round and just bring it home. You have to think of the big picture. 12 rounds to this championship season, six events, and uh, everyone is super important, so you can't afford to throw away. You have to do 70% of the race distance. Click laps completed by the leader to score points. So every day is important, and uh, it's a solid start for the uh, crowd strike racing organization here with two podium runs. Absolutely is. These guys are working through that 16, 17, 18 complex. That's where Shelby is right now. There he is. Just a couple more corners. Be able to bring it home and have a sweep for the weekend. And the Acura Accelerated Services, Racer's Edge, Acura NSX GT3. And so it is. Shelby Blackstock with Trent Inman and Racer's Edge bring the Acura NSX a second straight overall victory and class win. Martin Fuentes brings the Hublot Ferrari across with a Pro-Am class win that he shares with Rodrigo Baptista in that Squadra Corsa Garage Italia entry. And George Kurtz, as you said, Cal, impressive run along with Colin Brown in the 0-4 CrowdStrike DXDT machine, but there are our double race winners. What a weekend for this pairing in the GT World Challenge America, powered by AWS, fully on form here at Circuit of the Americas. Lots of celebrating going on once again in the Racer's Edge camp. Muted a little bit, I would suspect, by the potential 
that was lost here with that contact with Martin Barkey and uh, George Kurtz and that cut tire. But still enjoying every moment of this. And you want to hear an exuberant interview, folks. Don't miss out on the interview <laughs> with Martin Fuentes when this is done. So we take a look at the results here. And you can see him in a black stock, uh, the only silver entry and uh, winning it. But Baptista starting, Fuentes finishing, Kurtz and Brown. Gondor, quite impressive, and Matteo Cressoni just wicked quick put a, that team in a position to have a uh, podium in the Pro-Am category. David Askew and Ryan Dial, Marcelli and Barkey completing the top five in the Pro-Am category. And then as you said, I think you're absolutely right, they just did whatever they could to get that Porsche out and get an official finish for Max Root and Fred Pordad because Dakota and Metney would end up with second place points in Ammon. Had they not finished, it may have been a different swing there. And it's kind of coulda, woulda, shoulda maybe for Sophronis and Bleekemolen because a tremendous amount of potential for James late in that race until that contact happened. And it damaged that car just a little bit. And certainly some things for some of the teams to be working on and thinking about. And they'll have some time, won't they, Cal? The next round, mid-May, at uh, Canadian Tire Motorsports Park uh, on that wicked speed drome up there. Uh, that is going to be really, really fun. But the teams have a lot of time now to test on these on this new Pirelli tire and to get out there and really tweak on these cars just a little bit and get ready for that race. Yeah, chance to dust themselves off. Certainly a lot of action here today, a lot of uh, contact uh, during the course of this one. But um, some interesting results. Certainly this silver-silver uh, combination looks to be tough to beat, but I know some of those Pro-Am combinations at certain tracks will be very strong. I think the KPAX team, they look at the data from this weekend and say, we need to regroup here a little bit with Cosmo and Burn and try and get back our uh, pace that we've had before with this Bentley. And the field making its way down into pit lane and heading to the victory staging area. Shelby Blackstock brings the overall winning Acura NSX GT3 from uh, Racer's Edge and the Acura Accelerated Service entry for the second straight day. This car just driven by a different driver into victory circle. It was uh, Hinman yesterday as he finished that race. Blackstock does it today and an absolutely superb run for this driver pairing. Great stuff indeed. And uh, Shelby going to enjoy this moment. Yeah, giving that car a little bit of a pat. And the team comes down to give him a big bit of congratulations. And there's Trent. Just great execution. I mean, the pit stop was a little outside of the uh, minimum pit stop window by about four seconds. I think there may have been some miscommunication on the radio with Shelby before he released the car. But other than that, they really didn't put a foot wrong, really controlled the race nicely. Yep, they certainly did. All right, and off comes the helmet and the balaclava, and in goes Ryan Marine. Two wins to start the season for Shelby Blackstock, Trent Hedman, and Racer's Edge. Shelby's making sure he gets all of his gear taken care of, and for good reason, that stuff protects you. But I'll tell you what, when you came into this weekend, could you have dreamed that it would go as smoothly and as near perfectly as it did? Absolutely not. I mean, that's the biggest thing. I go into every weekend open-minded. It's racing. You have never, you have no idea what's ever going to happen. So the pairing with me and Tramp, Acura, Acura Services, I mean, it's been a dream come true. And the car was amazing both days. And can't say enough about Racer's Edge Motorsports. I mean, they did a phenomenal job this weekend. It sets the bar high, though, for the rest of this season. You ready to answer that? That it does, and I think we are for sure. I mean, everybody at Racer's Edge Motorsports did one hell of a job, so big thanks to our whole team. Perfect pit stops all weekend. It was awesome. Uh, Acura, Acura NSX. I mean, not much more can be said, right? The results prove uh, or speak for themselves. So, uh, yeah, there's going to be a lot more work to be done. We can certainly improve, but looking forward to uh, the process and getting it underway. Congratulations. We'll see you guys at the next one. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, what a weekend uh, for the team, for that driver pairing. Uh, just absolutely superb. Let's take a look at the full field results here provisionally. There it is, Hinman and Blackstock, second straight win in that silver entry car. Uh, Martin Fuentes and Rodrigo Baptista picking up the win in Pro-Am today, followed by George Kurtz and Colin Brown in the Mercedes, Gondor and Cressoni in the Ferrari, then the Mercedes of Dial and Askew, and the uh, team accurate of the winning one of Marcelli and Barkey rounding out the top five 
in the Pro-Am category. Yeah, important points there to uh, maintain that car up in the top five for our defending Pro-Am champions. Then you go down to the Amp class. What a great weekend for young Max Rue and his uh, teammate Fred Pordad. Had some contact there in race two, but nonetheless, they showed some pace. It's awesome to see those guys in the championship chase. Yeah, they did. And uh, with the Cody and Metney, not sure if they're going to run the full season. We hope they do because they show that they've got some serious pace. And then Sophronis with that uh, contact, a little bit of a problem uh, that thwarted a potential great finish for them as well. Back down to Ryan. Thanks, Greg. A fantastic drive in Pro-Am. Martin Fuentes and Rodrigo Baptista. Martin, though, at the end, that got pretty wild, including three wide at one point. Take us through those uh, closing laps. Well, actually, I'm looking at the front, but then I saw the Mercedes just try to pass everyone on the inside. And then I just avoided the crash, and uh, I just hope for the best. I, I try, try to keep myself inside, and uh, we, came, we came all three to the main straight. So it was, it, was, it was a handful. It was fun, though. It looked fun. Congratulations on a good start to the season. <laughs> Thank you. And you can see a bit of damage to that right rear corner from that contact. May have upset the car just a little bit. There's Rodrigo Baptista coming in. Happy to be celebrating a win for this team in the Pro-Am category in this second round of GT World Challenge America. We had some cars that have been through the wars here, Cal. No question about that. So obviously going to have to uh, take some time to regroup just a little bit. But we have three classes running here. Let's get down and hear from the winners of the AM category, Fred Pordad and Max Root with Ryan. Well, that turned into a bit of a race of survival, guys. Uh, I think you had the distinction of being able to bring it home. What was that about? Yeah, so Fred actually brought it home for us. Uh, started the race off. Uh, really struggling with the balance a little bit, uh, but we did what we could with what we had. And then uh, Fred brought it home clean and uh, clean-ish, and um, I'm glad we were able to get the win. So, looked like a handful at the end there, Fred. Yeah, you know the team said to to limp it on in, and I wasn't sure what was wrong, but someone was dragging. The wheel was at 90 degrees, and I think the rear wheel was not round anymore. So it was uh, an interesting drive, but uh, I'm glad we were able to bring it home. Uh, First event for us, you know, kind of a rough start to the season, but honestly, we learned a lot, and we look to uh, to really be there competing for the top prizes. We look forward to it as well. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, that's a pairing with a lot of potential in the AM category, to be sure, and Wright Motorsports is one of the top shelf teams, and, uh, you know, that program is going to be stout. Yeah, John Wright has had so much success over there. They won the Drivers' Championship a few years ago with Pat Long, of course, in the pro class, so... Uh, they and Porsche go together hand in hand, and certainly they've got a great young talent there in Max Rue and ably supported by Fred this weekend. Having a look here at uh, some of the iconic corners here, next race of this championship, a couple of months down the road, mid-May, Canadian Tire Motorsport Park, very different type of track, uh, is described as old school. Yeah, as much runoff room as you have here is kind of the opposite end of the spectrum there. You make a mistake there, typically has dire consequences. So it's a old school track. Uh, you got to be up on the wheel. You got to be on your toes. Otherwise, you will get uh, into trouble around there. Well, speaking of the calendar for the remaining events, there it is. Canadian Tire Motorsport Park in May and then to June to another glorious racetrack in Virginia International Raceway. Uh, then a little bit of a break into August uh, to Sonoma Raceway, which is one of the most technical, challenging roller coaster rides you can imagine. And then Road America, Wisconsin. I mean, uh, look at how this finishes in this. And then uh, the uh, Indianapolis 8 Hours, where all of these teams are uh, welcome to run in this championship. Great tracks. They really are just iconic venues that we're visiting. We'll have a little bit of a different personality and just some wonderful names. They do indeed. Uh, we're looking forward to the schedule unfolding here with this round complete here at Coda. And a good look here at the iconic turn one in the tower and the pit straight here at Circuit of the Americas. And, uh, well, I'll tell you, what uh, an interesting race. I mean, literally, that pit stop generated uh, a completely different set of uh, feel for each of the f halves of this race, didn't it? It did as a true battleground out there this afternoon. A lot of contact, probably the stewards not that happy with uh, as much contact that we saw out there, but everyone was going for it. And uh, there's a big break to the next round of the championship, so a chance for everyone to dust themselves off, regroup a little bit, try and dial their cars in a little bit. A lot of new combinations, so it's a fascinating sort of preview of what we're gonna see for the rest of the season. Well, we talked about the preview. How about a review? Here is the start as Trent Hinman leapt into the lead, and again, Ziad Gondor 
uh, and that Matteo Crisoni car able to uh, make a good move as well. And things got pretty fierce here pretty quickly. Yeah, as the two actors out front, but uh, Hinman certainly had the pace of his teammate Marcelli. And we saw some uh, highlights and lowlights, to be honest with you. You see the uh, Bentley turning them, uh, the back car around, a lot of damage there. And then this is David Ducati just losing control right through the S. There's no damage to the race car, but he start created another restart. Then we see George Kurtz just getting in a little bit deep there. And as they come off the corner, there's contact between the three entries, a little bit of damage to the 80 machine. And then uh, near the end here, you see this move by Ziad Gondor slicing through and uh, splitting Barky. Barky at that point, that car was not healthy and that gave Sophronis a chance and then Fred Pordad uh, coming up with a big head of steam, trying to get around the outside, more contact, damage the Sophronis car, but up front clear of it all with Shelby Blackstock getting a second straight win for Racer's Edge and Acura at Circuit of the Americas. Ooh. And have a look here at the podium where all of our competitors will be heading in fairly short over order. Uh, have the overall podium and then the class podiums will be unfolding here as we get ready for those to uh, begin as well. And uh, reminder that if you are uh, joining us here on the live stream, and we hope uh, a number of you are, we do have one more race to uh, run yet here, and that is the Pirelli GT4 American Sprint Race. Fascinating battle unfolding in that uh, race yesterday. We expect nothing less today. So an opportunity here for some more great racing at this great venue. But uh, uh, the celebration's about to begin for GT World Challenge America, powered by AWS. Yeah, it's been a great opening weekend to our championship season. Uh, we saw the weather kind of turn from kind of a gray start yesterday into some glorious sunshine here this afternoon. Perfect track conditions, some really fast lap times. I think that comes down to this new Pirelli tire that we're using this year, as well as the racetrack has had some resurfacing. It's a bit smoother in part, so maybe the cars can be run a little bit lower, and that typically generates uh, better lap times as well. Well, and other than teams saying we haven't had, you know, the adequate time to really understand the tire and this and that and make it work with the car, generally this new tire has met with very favorable reviews, hasn't it? It really has. I mean, it seems to be given really consistent lap times. We had no issues whatsoever. So certainly tick that box heading into a long championship season. And looking forward to these podiums getting underway as they're clearing some of the team cars off. We talked about the repaving of this track, and uh, it came down to uh, with some really harsh winters, and you don't get a lot of really freezing cold and snow and ice here, but rain in this type of terrain, uh, once it seeps underneath the track, it can do some uh, uh, some changes to it, and that's what they really look to address. Yeah, not so much this past winter, but the two winters before that, they had really heavy rainfalls for a number of days and months here, and it really just kind of created a lot of washout that ultimately led to some heaving in the racetrack and some big bumps. They did some grinding and then ultimately realized they had to do some resurfacing around this race surface. This is the home of the U.S. Grand Prix, of course, and those race cars really demand a smooth <laughs> surface to run on. Uh, so a lot of repaving up into turn one through two turn two, uh, then down the back stretch, and certainly a critical area through that triple apex of the carousel turn that they like to call it here from exit of turn 15 all the way to 19. So that again has really minimized some of the um, undulations in this race circuit, which would start to become very much part of the notebook and the setup sheet for the race teams who are competing here.
with some champ champagne for Fred and Max momentarily. Podium's continuing here. They've underway, just staging right. up and getting We're ready for the next group. Three seconds Let's away. listen in. Got a few different classes, obviously, that they've got to do these podiums for, trying to get things staged. The AM category, we just saw the winners up there ready to go. And we'll have the uh, silver and pro-AM podiums. The silver podium, just the one car. And I believe they also do an overall podium, so lots of celebrating to do in Victory Circle here. And it's always kind of special when you're standing on a podium where guys like Lewis Hamilton have picked up winning trophies and the like. That uh, extra right, meaningful. Your winners. Yeah, certainly a special place to stand and uh, at the end of a long, hard racing weekend. You want to be spraying some champagne. All right, trophies uh, being asked to be held aloft as they get the all-important pictures and the like. I really do hope that uh, we see uh, Metney and to Cody or uh, well Metney and uh, whoever he drivers. decides to ask to get off the sofa and come racing with him, continue here because the, they showed some some, peace, uh, some speed and some pace. Obviously, David had that little mistake, but uh, they were able to get back out on track again. Yeah, Metney really um, displayed some really good driving out there and, uh, you know, his little battle there with the Bentley at one stage of the race. He was on it. He wasn't willing to give up that position easily. So um, certainly he must have enjoyed this weekend on his home track. Well, that's a podium that indicates a lot of potential for some fabulous racing this year. Certainly, and uh, I'll tell you, I mean, uh, Crisoni and Gondor, great debut weekend for Ziad in this championship. But the guy up there, and everybody's pretty impressive as that champagne flies, George Kurt seems to have really raised his game once again, Cal. Yeah, he has. I think he gained a lot of confidence throughout the course of the 2019 season. They returned this year with the new Evo Mercedes AMG, and I think that makes the car even more comfortable to drive. And it's very much in his sweet spot. So despite the little contact they had, he went back on the attack, tried to grab that first win of the year. But I think he and Colin are going to be definite championship contenders. All right, the group photo at the top and the podiums here at Circuit of the America. Thanks so much for joining us for our coverage of GT World Challenge America, powered by AWS at Circuit of the Americas. Don't go too far. GT4 Sprint Racing for the Pirelli GT4 Sprint Championships up next.